back to uh, day two, the continuation of our board workshop. Uh, Ms. Craighead, down there by yourself, I'm going to have you lead us in the pledge, please. Welcome back, everyone. We're going to start day two, uh, and uh, I will kick it to Dr. Baker to set the tone once again and lead us off uh, with where we finished yesterday and where we're going to start today. Thank you. Yesterday was a great day, starting with a review of our data and a number of programs that allowed us to really look at the progress of our students and to think about, as a board and as an executive team, think about the needs of our students and where we need to make course corrections and adjustments in our plans. Um, we heard from the team around history, social science, and ethnic studies programming, an update from our communications office team and equity engagement and partnerships. And then we ended the day with our elementary and middle school offices talking about programmatic updates to their divisions. Um, we'll kick off with that today, continuing the conversation around teaching and learning. And because we ran a little bit late yesterday, we want to take an opportunity for you to ask questions about the afternoon presentations from the early learning and elementary school office as well as the middle school office. And then we'll get right into teaching and learning from a high school perspective. So I'll just um, push pause for us and allow you all just to reflect on especially the afternoon content and see if you'd like to ask Mr. Moskovitz or Dr. Lund any questions about what they and their teams presented yesterday. So colleagues, if you reflected on any questions you may have about the expanding learning opportunities, uh, universal transitional kindergarten, uh, the new room setups, as well as the middle school master planning. We had uh, two great presentations from our schools yesterday. I know those folks aren't in the room, but I'm sure Dr. Lund can, can answer any questions regarding middle school master scheduling um, and those two programs at Jefferson and Hamilton. Um, yes, actually I had a question about uh, our middle school master planning, um, Dr. Lund, if you could. I know we offer Spanish, but I was wondering if we offer any other languages for middle schoolers um, years ago, and uh, Dr. Kale will attest to this, at Hill Middle School, we used to do a semester of French and a semester of Spanish, and then the student could choose to continue on with their choice of language. And so I'm wondering if uh, we currently have anything like that. The only other program we currently have in place is uh an exploratory French program at Robinson, but that will actually be phasing out. Uh, and the reason being is they don't offer French. So you, you can take exploratory French in sixth grade, but you can't continue currently with their uh, current master schedule. So we're really thinking about if you're gonna offer an exploratory course, that you, you really should be able to then take that course. Um, so we, we tried to clean that up in terms of when that sequence occurs. So. Nor normally the sixth grade is that opportunity to explore a course and then that transition to seventh would be that opportunity to then take that next course so that's what we're really trying to build into our scheduling mov moving forward but additional language is certainly something that we can consider um, depending on staffing obviously and other sort of considerations spanish is often the most uh, popular course so it's really responding to to students needs and interests uh, but there have been some considerations for specific programs. So I think of like Polly's program in particular with their PACRIM CIC that offers both Japanese and Chinese and what that could look like as an exploratory for feeder programs into those schools. Yeah, yeah. not to put you on the spot here, um, Dr. Lund, but I, I was hoping that maybe you can go into a little bit more depth about the school-wide cluster model and the sample? Because I did have some questions, but I just wanted to make sure that I heard correctly. Yeah, I appreciate the question. So the school-wide cluster model is one gate model um, that was considered or that we have used in uh, different settings. The traditional model where you pull all your gate students into a single classroom with high achieving students, which would be more of like a, a classroom specific model. What the total school-wide cluster model does is it allows for more heterogeneous grouping of students uh, within a school site. There's a couple different ways of implementing the model depending on the number of students that you have that qualify for a gate program. 
So you heard Dr. McGee reference the fact that she has enough GATE students to do a clustering of GATE students across all of their accelerated classes. Um, in some schools where you might have more limited number of GATE students, it would be deferring to the example that I shared yesterday, where you would pull certain students into specific courses as the GATE clustered um, accelerated course, but then also have the additional courses as high achieving accelerated courses. So it allows for all courses to be deemed accelerated. It allows for more flexible uh, placement of students across classrooms versus the default, um, once again, that Dr. McGee referenced is that when you have a single course or a single class, it creates basically tracking of those students throughout their course schedule um, just by default. And I appreciate that. I guess the I was looking at this slide. It wasn't numbered, but this slide here. I just wanted to confirm that I understand that this is just an example of the numbers, but I wanted to make sure that there was a correct uh, correlation to the number of students that will uh, be applicable to the situation. And so I'm, I'm sure that it is, but I just wanted to get confirmation on Yeah, that. so this was an example that was shared basically on, on how to use data to mm -hmm. really specifically place students. Okay. So right now we obviously have access to additional data that we haven't historically had mm -hmm. with iReady data, in addition to our SBAC data, mm -hmm. in addition to our Edge Elastic data. We just have a lot of data to consider for placement of students. And it would be, according to the model, looking to see how you create, once again, a heterogeneous grouping of students, yeah. um, but not also like perhaps a huge variation. Correct. Uh, making and, it more and challenging now you see where for I was teachers going to go. as a result. Correct. So, what this model allows is for strong, strong student models in every classroom okay. versus, um, like I said, what, is, what could happen historically has been a homogeneous grouping right. of students. And when you take all the lowest students and you put them into the same class, that comes with added challenges for, mm -hmm. for a teacher as well as for students in that classroom. Yep. No, I completely understand. Thank you. And then just, I just had a couple of questions, um, and Dr. Benita has shared some as well, so I'll try to wrap them up so we can be respectful of folks' time today. I know we've got folks from out in the field. Um, so on the accelerated math courses right now, 62% um, of eighth graders are enrolled in algebra. Has that increased, held steady over the last several years? Uh, that's an increase. Okay. So if we go back probably five years, it was in the mid to upper 40s. So that's a significant increase from, from five, six years ago. Like I said, the intent here is to really have that continue to increase. Uh, some of our high school pathway programs require algebra for possible acceptance into those programs. So it just cr opens additional doors for students um, when they do have access to algebra. And like I said, we don't wanna put students into a course when they're not prepared to, but at the same time, if we can support them through an algebra development course, for example, um, that could be the additional support they need to be able to access a higher level program. So, so by doing um, this cluster model, you know, then 81% of sixth graders are in accelerated courses or potentially all sixth graders are in an accelerated course. We would hope that a few years from now that eighth grade algebra rate would somewhat correlate to with yeah. the support, obviously, for those students. Yeah, that's we would the hope goal. that that steadily increases um, as students move from Math 6 Accelerated, if they've been successful in that course, into the Math 7 Accelerated course, um, while also recognizing the fact that if it was too challenging for students in Math 6 Accelerated, that they could default back into a Math 7 course if necessary. Okay. And then talking about the inclusion model at Jefferson. It's fascinating to me because it seems like the timing of that program is similar to our CCT that started really early. So we've got this sandwich thing happening. Was that coordinated? Was it an, an organic thing that happened? Uh, just talk to me a little bit about that model. Yeah, I would say in this case, it was somewhat of an or organic approach with a staff, a uh, special ed team at Jefferson that was really excited about the possibility of co-teaching. Um, that's something that we've been incorporating into our master schedule symposiums is that opportunity to create co-teaching session, uh, sections for students, um, with obviously two teachers working together in a general education setting, um, in a real collaborative approach, but that also requires additional training and support. So our, um, OCIPD team that has put together specific trainings to support co-teaching, our OSSS team that has uh, special ed administrators that support that work. Uh, so it's really, a, in this case, a team at Jefferson that was really ready to 
make that transition to a more collaborative, inclusive approach for students. Uh, and then obviously with a, a general education teaching staff that was also willing to partner in that work. Um, so I think all those factors put together, and I think as Dr. McGee alluded to, really over the past three years to really grow and expand the program. So this past year we did provide uh, some additional staffing and support to Jefferson to really go with a school-wide model. Thank you, and I think that's exciting because in this district we historically are a pilot to scale program. So I'm sure there's parents that heard about the possibility of that for their kids. Um, but understanding that that pilot came with, you said, extra supports, um, some unique training for staff, additional funding. So how do we, as we plan forward um, for models that seem to uh, be great for kids, how do we plan forward in terms of all of the pieces around professional development as well as extra resources that are required? So thank you for that. You're welcome. And I will turn the gavel back over to Dr. Benitez. We did cover most of the questions, so I think we were ready to start. Perfect. I'll look at the YouTube video and see the responses. Thank you for getting us going this morning, Vice President. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Apologies morning. for being a little late this morning. Um, so where are we in the- We are ready to start today's presentation. Okay, well, good morning. In that case, easy. I can come in and just okay. take, take it away. <laughs> So I'll um, go ahead and call up the high school team. We have a team of presenters that include staff from OCIPD and the high school office who are going to continue the conversation about school program updates with the presentation on link learning um, as the conclusion of our, our work around teaching and learning for this workshop. So Ms. Wiley, are you going first? Or could, okay, I'll Dr. kick Gale, us off. Go ahead, okay, thank you. so good morning. So yesterday we had some time looking at um, early learning with my colleague, Mr. Moskovitz, in middle school with Dr. Lund, and today we're shifting into high school. Very exciting. Um, we, uh, what was I going to say? I just lost my train of thought. Uh, okay, yesterday you heard a, a lot of great presentations that talked about pathways and linked learning work. So you could see it's threaded across our organization. But new to OCIPD this year is the Career Pathways Office, which is centering a lot of the work around the curriculum aspects. Um, and in our office, you will find uh, pathway design and development, and then workforce readiness, uh, which includes uh, CTE. And that Career Pathways Office in my office then works really closely with Dr. Camarino and his high school team. So we are together all the time having lots of good conversations and bringing the linked learning to life. Okay, good, the slides are up. All right, so for this morning, I'm gonna pass the, uh, thank you, I'm gonna pass it to uh, Carrie. She's approaching the microphone and she's going to kick us off. She is our program administrator for college and career readiness. Uh, she's gonna give a linked learning overview this morning. And then behind us, I'd like to introduce you to Renee Shipman, if you haven't already met. She's our assistant director of pathway development and she's gonna talk about developing linked learning pathways. And then uh, next to her is Michael McBride. If you haven't met Michael, he's new to LBUSD this year, and he's working as our Assistant Director of Workforce Readiness. He will be talking about high quality CTE programs. And then when they're finished presenting, we will be calling up our uh, colleagues from the high school office and Wilson High School to talk about pathway triad leadership. So Carrie, you can take it away on linked learning approach. Great, good morning everybody. It's exciting to be here with you. Um, so I, uh, like Dr. Kale said, I'm just gonna take a few moments and talk about kind of big picture linked learning approach in our district and you'll hear a little bit more specifically about some of those strategies uh, with my colleagues Renee and Michael in a few moments. So big picture, the linked learning approach, which has been in our district now for over a decade, is centered around four core components. Um, and is contextualized with industry sectors where we frame the learning that happens in each of those pathways. So those four components are rigorous academics. That's really important because it means that every single one of our students, regardless of the pathway that they're in, is taking a rigorous A to G course of study that is available to them, and that is with, uh, that's any pathway that you're in. The next component is career technical training. 
um, and you uh, will hear more about some of this a little bit later, but that is um, made up of programs of study, courses that articulate across that program of study with knowledge and skills that are carefully structure structured in order for kids to learn something about that industry sector in that context. The next component is work-based learning. And this is that opportunity where we bring industry professionals into kids. We take kids out into the field. They're really able to bridge their academic experiences, not only in career technical education, but also in the rest of their academic courses and put those into real world professional context. It really helps to answer that, why do I need to learn this question? Right? Um, and then the last component is comprehensive student supports. This is all of the counseling that is provided within a pathway context. Um, it also includes career planning and any of the social emotional supports and any other interventions that that pathway designs really fall under that last component. So over that decade plus, um, from pilot to now, I think we're around 12 years, but um, I'm safer saying decade plus uh, without having the exact date. Um, it's always been a strategy for, for equity. It's always been a way of really thinking about providing experiences across our really large system um, that parity each other, right? That have uh, similar components across so that we know a student is receiving a, a similar experience. So all of our students are in pathways. We call that wall-to-wall. -wall. If you've heard that phrase many a time, a wall-to-wall -wall pathways. So that means every student is involved in a pathway. And later you'll hear Ms. Shipman talk a little bit about the different types of those pathways and, and the characteristics that define them. We have standards provided to us um, by the Link Learning Alliance around the quality of those pathways to ensure that everyone is developing towards or has already achieved a high quality pathway. So we have standards that guide that work for us. We have varied levels. You can come in at silver or gold. We also have the entry level, um, which I believe is candidate. Um, so we have that to help guide our work around defining high quality pathway and to give us a roadmap to define those, um, those components. Uh, and then just knowing that this also ensures that regardless of what industry sector you happen to be interested in as a student, whether what geographical region you're in and the city, that we are all striving towards a similar experience for kids. So why link learning as a strategy, right? Why, why did we pick that for this? Um, so over the decade plus of time that this has been not only in Long Beach, but has been in multiple districts across California, uh, and you'll hear a little bit more about those original nine districts. You'll hear DI9 language sometimes in the field, um, which Long Beach was one of the original districts that piloted this approach and has, has continued with it for all this time. It's been studied um, by external uh, researchers, uh, primarily the Stanford Research Institute. You'll hear a little bit about that with Renee, and it's also referred to in the handout that we've provided, um, that have studied this initiative over time. And what we know from the field and from these studies is that link learning increases graduation and decreases dropout rates. We know that it increases A to G completion. We know that those um, soft skills or 21st century skills that students need to be productive in the workforce and beyond and in post-secondary increase with these programs. We know that the strongest effect of these programs comes for students who have entered in a lower achieving state when they come into high school, and this t tends to help move them quicker uh, in that progression. And what we know from all of this and from this research is that pathway quality really matters, right? And really putting the time and effort to developing pathways in that way is really important to achieve those goals. So another piece of thinking about pathway quality and another uh, time where we really begin to think about that strategy is when we need to consider opening pathways, closing pathways, or potentially transforming pathways. So in any of these circumstances, we think about a few key pieces of data around how we consider um, these options. Number one, first and foremost, we're always going to think about student enrollment and interest data. Uh, as you heard yesterday, you had a presentation around high school choice, and when you uh, operate in a high school choice system, and pair that with what we know is a situation of declining enrollment, where students want to be and where their interests are really matter. So that's something that you take a look at. Equally important, we look at the impact of local and regional industry sectors um, and partners. 
would have been a better word, I think. Um, those partners tell us when the industry is transforming, they tell us when there's new opportunities, and they help us keep that preparation really relevant for the students that are in these pathways. A really good example of that, um, and something that's happened within the last few years, is the transformation of the uh, Academy of Global Logistics at Cabrillo High School, who was adopted by the Port of Long Beach. They used to be uh, a more traditional business and finance pathway, and then when the port reached out and kind of said, you know, we see an opportunity, geographically we're similar, business finance is a good underpinning, is there a way to partner? That need to develop a pathway, that desire to help develop our students toward a local um, industry sector with a lot of potential uh, in post-secondary options, really helped us think about transforming and supporting that pathway to transform to be, while still in the business finance industry sector, geared toward global logistics. So that's a really good example of when the industry really helps us think about how to transform pathways. We also think about teacher credentials and available staff. You're going to hear a little bit more about that credentialing with um, Mike McBride later when he talks about CTE, but that's something that we really need to consider in the shaping of pathways. And lastly, we do think about facilities and equipment. It's really important. That's more when we open the, uh, a pathway or transform, uh, but that's really important to make sure that if you have large equipment or lab needs that you have the available space or a space that can transform in order to accommodate those pathways. So that's some of the good thinking that goes into really helping helping that big picture and making sure that we can accommodate our pathways and support them um, in a sustainable and equitable way across the system. So to go a little further into this, I'm going to bring up Renee Shipman, who's going to talk about developing those link learning pathways. Before I hand it off to her, are there any questions about the first part that I could be helpful with? Okay. I do have one question. Yeah. And, um, I I know that you that we may cover this in the future slide, so if that's the case, let me know. Sure. Um, so it's a kind of a chicken or the egg uh, question. Is all CTE in link learning? I could have paid you to ask me that question. <laughs> um, so I am going to say that in about two slides, okay. you're going to get a really good description of that. But it was a perfect tee up, so thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. sure. One more question, please. Um, could you say a little bit more about the relationship between enrollment decline and pathways? Sure. So when you design a pathway, and um, Ms. Shipman's going to talk a little bit more about cohorting and, and what that is as a key feature, you, you need to make sure that you have enough students to kind of fill the course of study. So as you slowly experience declining enrollment, it at a certain tipping point, right, becomes where you may not have. And it's very case by case. We work super closely with the high school office and all of this because the numbers are something that um, as, uh, lives a little bit more in their half of the shop, but we're talking all the time, right, about when that critical point does happen, then you need to look at all those data. We collaborate, we talk with principals, and really think about how do we consolidate so that all of the pathways can stay healthy and robust. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having us. So I'm Renee Shipman, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about developing our link learning pathways and understanding what a link learning pathway is. So we're going to start with our pathways in Long Beach. So as Carrie mentioned, in Long Beach, all high schools are wall-to-wall -wall pathway. This means that all of our high school students are part of a pathway and begin that experience in ninth grade. Students select their pathways based on their interest, and currently we have 38 LBUSD pathways. But not all LBUSD pathways are linked learning pathways. Characteristics of an LBUSD pathway include groups of students and teachers that are cohorted with a course of study that includes academic classes. So that's the big idea of all pathways in Long Beach. When we think about linked learning pathways, this includes a group of students and teachers cohorted with a course of study that includes both academic and industry-themed classes to support relevant learning experiences in and outside of the classroom. Currently, we have 32 linked learning pathways. Within the link learning pathway is that CTE sequence. I think this was the question that was just asked. 
So a CTE course offers industry-themed coursework to support relevant, engaging learning experiences for students. The CTE sequence of classes provides a foundation for the pathway and supports the development of skills and knowledge needed for the pathway industry. While all CTE sequences are in linked learning pathways, not all linked learning pathways have a CTE sequence. Some pathways have a technical core sequence, which is an academic themed sequence, but it also supports an industry integrated course of study. So that's, those are our different layers of pathways. So now I'd like to give you a definition of what a linked learning pathway really looks like. So in a linked learning pathway, you would see a group of students learning academic content through an industry lens. They would have a shared sequence of courses that includes math, English, social science, science, and CTE taught by a cohort of teachers at each grade level. Each year, students participate in work-based learning opportunities in their industry and have adults that provide academic and personal supports. Combined, this structure fosters a college and career ready graduate. So let's think about what are we talking about when we say college and career graduate. Naturally, we go to our district graduate profile. So when we look at our graduate profile, this serves as the North Star for our students. It is also the document that our pathways use to provide opportunities to grow experiences for our students to develop these attributes. Pathway teams develop their pathway student outcomes to align to both the graduate profile as well as their pathways industry sector standards to prepare our students for all post-secondary options through curriculum, applied learning, work-based learning experiences, college and career exploration, students have a variety of opportunities to develop these attributes in their four years in their pathway in high school. This helps us achieve our district graduate profile. So we see this work happening in our classrooms, but we also see it being validated by external research. And so I have a slide about SRI. There's also a handout in your board packet that is called the advantage that also talks about this. So Carrie referred to the SRI research previously, and I'd like to talk about it a little bit more. SRI is an independent agency that has studied link learning for the duration of the district initiative, the link learning district initiative, which was an eight year study, I'm sorry, a nine year study on nine districts, including Long Beach throughout the state of California. So these were the nine districts that were piloting link learning and had really a, a long-term plan on how to actualize, actualize this for students across systems. So the findings identify that students in high quality link learning pathways earned more credits, including access to AP and dual enrollment credits. They were more likely to graduate from high school and they had opportunities to develop skills such as collaboration, communication, and other academic mindsets. In more recent findings, the studies, the research suggests that students who are often at promise, including African American, Latinx, and English language learner students, are earning more credits than students in traditional high school settings. So in Long Beach, we are wall to wall, but the other eight districts did not adopt that strategy. So it is nice to be part of a study where you can see traditional high school experiences in contrast to link learning pathways and be able to see the difference in impact. So in the other districts, they've not adopted a wall-to-wall -wall strategy, which is why we can see what a traditional high school impact looks like in contrast to the link learning approach. So this slide and the resources in your handbook uh, ref have 
long range data, but I also want to share some student level data. So this is a student, Brianna, and she graduated last year. So when we asked our students to talk about how has your link learning pathway helped prepare you for whatever you're going to do beyond high school, her response was, my pathway has helped me develop my public speaking sp skills. Being able to effectively and confidently public speak enabled me to excel in presentations and other finals for core classes that required speaking in a classroom setting. So I remember meeting Brianna as a ninth grade student and she was quiet, she was shy, she was not able to stand in front of a class and present in any, any way. However, over the four years that I knew and learned about Brianna, I saw her confidence grow. I saw her leadership grow. This was a young lady who was able to be a um, leader both in the classroom as well, in, as, in, well as in academics. We went to Sacramento where I watched her lobby for environmental change in front of legislators. So she really came into her own skill set and her own leadership. And it was because of the experiences she had in the leadership and public service pathway at Wilson High School. I'm proud to know this young lady, and it's also exciting to know that she is now at UC Berkeley, and she is studying pre-law, and she is thriving. So when I think about the data tells a very clear story, but I, our students also have a very clear story. So how do we get to this? How do we get to a student who is ready to thrive in her post-secondary options? We think about our industry sectors. So we go to the industry sectors because this is really the foundation of how we grow our pathways in Long Beach and in, in our region. These are the 15 industry sectors in California and the blue bolded industry sectors are the pathways that represent Long Beach. So we have 11 of the 15. This is really critical because these industry sectors are our work-based learning opportunities. They are our business partners. They're our regional network. And so without these industries, we really can't provide an applied learning, hands-on relevant experience. So when we look at this list, it's quite a range, but the ones that are, we see most frequently across Long Beach are the arts media entertainment pathways, engineering pathways, health medical pathways, and public service pathways. These pathways are found throughout Long Beach in small thematic settings and large comprehensive schools and allow our students to select a pathway in high school experience that is going to be the best fit for them and their families. So thinking back to the beginning of our conversation, I talked about a definition. I talked about um, how link learning pathways provide an opportunity for students to learn. This is really what a snapshot of a pathway in Long Beach Unified looks like. We have an integrated program of study that has rigorous academic and technical core classes that meet our A through G requirements for university. They prepare our students for post-secondary options, including work, military, apprenticeships, two and four-year university options for all students. So you're able to enter the world of post-secondary options with whatever choice you want to pursue, not one or the other. You have work-based learning experiences, and we talk about Carrie mentioned our relationship with the Port of Long Beach. The I think Port we have has partnered. A couple of quick. Yeah. questions just yeah. on what you're covering right absolutely now. it's not a question it's just asking you to say that again I think we understand in this room that when we talk about our link learning pathways and CTE courses we understand them to be a through G ready that these are not separate from college and career I think we say that a lot in this room but I know outside of us that might not be as clear so could you just state you that those two over? bullet points again absolutely. really clearly Sure. So we can. So when that. we talk about a program of study, I think is what you're you're talking about. We're talking about a rigorous sequence of courses that are A to G, that include academic coursework and technical coursework. So all students take 
all both options. It's not an or. You're not going to a technical versus an academic. It is integrated into your entire course of study. And that prepares you for all of the options after high school. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna go to work-based learning and we're gonna talk about our relationship with the port. So they are an incredible partner for us in Long Beach Unified. They started a uh, Academy of Global Logistics at Cabrillo and this year they expanded their collaboration to the ACE Academy at Jordan. The partnership with the Port of Long Beach allows our students access to industry mentors, allows exploration of all of the different career opportunities at the port for our students. It provides internships in the summer and it also provides scholarships for our students to pursue any post-secondary options related to the Port of Long Beach um, industries. So when we think about our work-based learning partners and our integrated, uh, yes, our work-based learning partners, the Port of Long Beach really is a model of how we should be thinking about engaging with business because they are partners in supporting our students to have relevant learning experiences, set them up for success. And then the final piece is our student support. So here I wanna highlight our college and career readiness teams that are teams of counselors, college advisors, college and career specialists who work with our students to prepare for what post-secondary could be, what it could look like. We see these teams work in partnership with Long Beach City College and Cal State Long Beach to provide post-secondary access while students are still in high school. So through dual enro enrollment, our students are able to take courses at the college, courses at City College and, the and Cal State Long Beach, but where this really is highlighted most powerfully is at Browning High School. So at Browning, we have an early college model where our students have the ability to enroll in a AA, it's called an ADT, Associates to Transfer, Associates Degree, degree to Transfer. Took me a minute, <laughs> took me a minute. So they are able to enroll in that and for hospitality while also completing their high school degree. So this is a really special program because we see this early model having a lot of success in other school districts and other settings, and so we're very fortunate now to have that at Browning as well. So I wanna pause with this graphic for a moment. So when I meet with teams when I talk about link learning, I really like to use this graphic because I think that it illustrates all of the different pieces of what makes a high quality link learning pathway. And you can see that there's a lot of different integrated approaches, lots of different components that come together to, to develop a high quality experience for students. So we've talked, or I've talked, about what a pathway is. We've talked about the connection to our graduate profile. I've shared some data and student voices and provided a snapshot. So I think this really puts it all together, but I want to close with a course of study. So here you see two examples of a technical core sequence in computer science pathways. These are two different technical core sequences that are offered at our high schools in computer science. And you'll notice that in ninth grade, it is an introductory course. They're learning about computer science. And by the time they get to their 12th grade year, they're really doing advanced, um, deep, complex work that is going to culminate in some type of demonstration of their four-year sequence. What you'll notice is that just like I talked about at the very beginning, we have CTE sequences and we have technical sequences. The CTE sequence up at the top is a four-year sequence. It is taught by a CTE teacher who has a background in computer science. The bottom sequence is a technical course sequence, and this is a Project Lead the Way curriculum, so it's a four-year Project Lead the Way curriculum 
Um, but it's probably taught by a math teacher who has been trained in Project Lead the Way to support the technical industry skills needed to develop our students' readiness to further engage in computer science. So before I turn this over to Mr. McBride, are there any questions? Mr. Otto. If we can go back to the, the first slide, um, the SRI International Impact of Linked Learning. Um, the numbers there, I, I want to make sure I understand them. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one says more credits earned by the end of the high school is, is what you're saying is that if you go through this program, you are likely to get 8.9% more credits than you would have otherwise? What this is suggesting is that students in linked learning pathways are more likely to earn 8.9 more credits than students in a traditional non-linked learning experience. Got it. And so with 3.1, uh, they're more likely to graduate from high school if they go through a linked learning program? Yes. Okay, I can figure out the rest of it then. Um, and then um, um, these 15 industry sectors and pathways, where did those come from? Are those, we have we developed those or are they given to us by some? Uh, where do they come from? Yeah. So the 15 industry sectors are actually developed by the state of California. So these are not just regional for Southern California. These are across the state and have been identified. And I think that Michael will, Mr. McBride will talk a little bit more about the industry sectors in, okay. in his slides. Okay. Um, then, let's see, did I have one more? I can, no, that's it, thanks. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. So I heard you talk a little bit about the work-based learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, I was hoping you could dive into that conversation a little bit more, uh, specifically around how many opportunities do we have available in uh, our district along with um, what major business partners are we linked with? Are we linked with, mm -hmm. I know that there's been conversation of us being linked with the chamber. Obviously we have a great transportation uh, system here with Long Beach Transit. I'm, I'm just curious on what major uh, partners we've been linked with outside of the port, which mm -hmm. the port is great, is all, uh, great also. And then also along with that, I'm just curious about how many opportunities have we created for our students uh, maybe over the past year or so. Sure. Are you gonna touch on that a little bit? Oh. Briefly, so one of one of the things that is exciting for us this year is that we are collaborating with um, Mr. Grayson's office and the the best business engagement and strategic partnerships office to continue to develop more business connections and business relationships. So that has been part of our work this year. Um, we. I'm, I'm going to, can you put a pause in that and ask it for Mr. McBride? I can, only if you can say that long sentence. With Would you like to hear it again? Of business of business, business. <laughs> engagement, and strategic partnerships. <laughs> yes? <laughs> yeah, okay. no, I can definitely wait on that. But okay. I am curious about uh, hearing those numbers. Obviously, I understand. Uh, one of the things that I've been a strong component of is experiential learning. Mm -hmm. And so creating spaces for kids to learn not only academically but also in the field and I think that these work learning opportunities help do so so I'm, I'm really curious about just hearing those numbers can do you want to come over okay so are there any other, are there any other <laughs> are there we'll, we'll come to back to that are there any other questions for this me? might require mr. McBride too oh, okay. <laughs> no no um, so <laughs> This is more of a, no pun intended, global question. Okay. Uh, for me, um, given the context of our 21st century global economy, mm -hmm. given the benefits that you've shared um, for students that are either doing linked learning and or CTE and or a combination of that, uh, and also given the context of this college and career readiness, uh, that is one of our goals. Um, and the wall-to-wall -wall aspects of this. Mm -hmm. Can you share an example and or an experience where a student would graduate for one of, my, one of our high schools in a pathway, but would not necessarily 
have a link learning and or CTE experience. Um, and if that's the case, um, is it a matter of that um, we just don't have the ability to offer an experiential CTE and or link learning experience or are there other factors as to why we wouldn't want every student uh, to gain the benefits of link learning, CTE, uh, and or experiential learning, uh, okay. if you will. So I'm gonna try to answer your question. Yeah. So, and, I, and I can say it again easier if you want. <laughs> so when, we, when I started, I had the circles, we had the that's, link learning. That's what I'm looking yes, at, yeah. Yes, perfect. Yeah, yeah. So we have 38 Long Beach Unified pathways, mm -hmm. and we have 32 link learning pathways. Mm -hmm. The difference in that number are pathways that have non, they're non-industry aligned. Those would be things like Quest, Pace, Wave, um, CIC, Merit, thank you. Those are not industry aligned, so there is not going to be um, often a work-based learning experience connected to those pathways because that is not the model for those pathways. Um, students can choose whatever pathway they are interested in, and so families may be choosing a non-industry aligned pathway versus a linked learning pathway. And I guess that would be my answer to your question. Can I explain to why that choice would be made? No. Um, yeah, and I guess I'm asking us on our end, um, we can still have experiential learning opportunities in CIC. Absolutely, right, as an and I, that's uh, not yeah. what. Can I ask? Is that okay? Sure. I, I would say yes, we can have experiential learning in non aligned pathways. Mm -hmm. However, they wouldn't be a cohesive sequence of industry focused. It would be maybe um, a variety of Got different it. experiences. Got it. Do you want to add? I did. I just wanted to add that over time, yeah. as we've supported, can you hear if I don't, I don't want to crowd anyone here? Yeah. <laughs> um, over time, as we've supported the various well, models. Sorry, sure. It's for the people listening, so. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, over time, as we've supported the different models of pathways, what we use to guide that experience rather than a technical core in a specific industry mm -hmm. sector, we ask those pathways to look at the district graduate profile. So in that, you can still see some core values and some core expectations around interacting with industry um, and still getting some type of work-based learning experience, but it's not necessarily going to look the same in those pathways. We have models in those pathways where students do um, some exploration in personal interest so you might have a cohort of students that actually look at multiple industry sectors and experience things on a personal level rather than something that's kind of ushered through a sequence of courses that is intentionally designed to an industry sector so do they get graduate um, profile aligned experiences in all pathways absolutely is it all looking as it does in a link learning pathway no it looks a little different yeah and that's that's great um you answered the question, and I think for me it's more of an open-ended question as a system. So let me just use an example, uh, right? So um, as, as, as Mr. Otto asked, we have these industries that are identified by the state, right? That doesn't necessarily mean that we confine ourselves to only offering work-based experience in those industries. So they may not be CTE uh, industries, but you know, I can imagine robotics. All right, things that we are doing in our high schools that wouldn't necessarily fall into one of the link learning pathways and or CTE core course clusters, but that students would still, as is, as is shared, have some kind of work-based, field-based, experiential experience that could be cohesive, uh, but that wouldn't necessarily be linked to one of the 15 uh, or so in industry sectors, right? And so for those six pathways that are identified, um, given the benefits in graduation and student success, just kind of an open-ended, you know, is there an opportunity to explore what we could do, do in those six pathways that would also provide some of the benefits of linked learning and CTE? So more open-ended, all right? And again, I'm going based on context and benefits mm -hmm. uh, here, particularly for our more at-promise students that for whatever reason may or may not get into a pathway 
Um, and, and, you know, they may not know. I mean, there may be a, a bunch of reasons why parents and or students may decide one pathway over another. So just, again, open-ended, but I was just curious about those six pathways that aren't uh, link learning and or CTE. Mm -hmm. I guess I would add to Dr. Menendez that the six pathways that are being named are typically, they are um, specialized pathways mm -hmm. that have an entrance criteria. And so most of our At Promise students will reap the benefits of being in a link learning pathway, as has been just, you know, described mm -hmm. what the benefits are um, that is industry theme. It mm -hmm. also doesn't mean that the student doesn't have an opportunity for internship mm -hmm. or other experiences mm -hmm. outside of the aligned. Um, experience that they have through work-based learning. Sure, sure. And, and that's true for the six accelerated or specialized pathways as well as linked learning pathways. Yeah, and I, thank you, Dr. Baker. And, and I just want to lift up, like Board Member Kerr did, like this isn't the end-all, be-all in terms of post-graduation opportunities, uh, right? So the example of Browning, uh, right? They're not getting less of anything at Browning. They're getting more in addition to what every other student uh, is, right? So I, I, I want us to be able to highlight that through a lens that just because you are not in a specific pathway, whether that be link learning or have an opportunity for CTE or be in the LBSD pathways that are not, uh, that the experiential part of it for me is the, is the part that I think we can and we should lift up. And so I was just wondering if there were other considerations that's to... You know, we talked about resources yesterday with Mr. Moskovitz, right? If, if we have resources, but just we don't have capacity, just exploring those opportunities as well. So thank you for that. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Michael. I'm going to turn it over. Okay. Good. Can you guys hear me? Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you all. I'm going to speak a little more in depth about the CTE portion of LBUSD Pathways. And to ground us first, um, I'll give a definition that I'm, I'm going to share of what, what is CTE. CTE provides students with the academic and technical skills, knowledge, and training necessary to successfully navigate their post-secondary future. So one thing I want to highlight is that at the core, um, Core academic learning is a central part of CTE, along with the technical or work skills. And finally, it gives students a clear blueprint for how to achieve academic and career goals after they graduate from high school. Um, like our pathways, CTE does not ask students in ninth or 10th grade to select and lock into one career or one job, but to learn about a certain industry sector and set goals around their future, whether they choose to enter that career or not. Um, if they choose not to enter that career or pursue that, that's fine. Oftentimes there's great value in our students learning about a career or industry sector and knowing that they do not want to pursue that. If they can eliminate that, that's great as well. Think of it, I often think about uh, friends in college that majored in one thing and then they went into something completely different. It doesn't mean that college is a waste. They still use those skills, so they just transferred over. Um, and it is also a lot cheaper for them to do this now in high school rather than their post-secondary lives. Um, as the saying goes, college can be a very expensive work experience program. So we want to make sure to help them put them on the path of what they want to do. To start, though, with CT, I want to look, go back a little bit um, and look at um, the old vocational ed model. Because there's a distinct difference between the old vocational ed education model that I grew up with and the CT that LBUSD is offering today. In the voc ed model, high schools often offered students with the either or uh, when it came to preparing for college or career, not offering students the opportunity to engage in both. Today's CTE, in alignment with the link learning approach, truly offers college and career readiness for all students that we serve in LBUSD. And just to highlight a few differences, voc ed offered limited uh, programs for limited students. So often it was centered around one job or industry sector. And we know that students often didn't choose to be in voc ed. They were often tracked there. CTE courses are aligned to all 15 industry sectors uh, that we offer in the state of California and are for all high school students in, in our district. In addition, voc ed was offered in lieu of academic programs was offered often as a separate track or as a credit recovery for graduation. And of course, we know that many of the students didn't have a choice to be in there. 
CTE programs, on the other hand, establish high school and post-secondary partnerships towards supporting students to obtain their AA, their bachelor's degree, or even higher while preparing students who want to directly enter the workforce upon graduation. So they have those choices. At its core, CTE employs, uh, CTE courses, excuse me, employ a hands-on approach where students engage with industry standard equipment and experiences and complete performance assessments in CTE-specific labs, which allow students to demonstrate the knowledge that they've gained in their classes. In addition, CTE courses provide students with the technical skills that give them um, the necessary foundation to successfully enter and advance in a career, not just a job, but a career. These skills that they're learning, these work skills, they, are, they also often assist students in their academic pursuits as well. Students in CTE courses hone their presentation, time management, and collaboration skills that while those are highly valued in the workplace, they're just as beneficial for students in their academic pursuits in their daily lives every day at school. Now I want to just, earlier Renee spoke about CTE being the core of um, our pathways. Um, here you'll see just some, some data in terms of how many students we have in CTE courses. Uh, so currently we have about 13,400 um, students enrolled in 99 CTE courses. We're going to have 100 really soon. Um, and that are taught by 92 CTE credentialed teachers across the district. So you can see that it's, it has a wide reach. It is important to note that CTE is regulated in the same manner as other core academic courses. In California, CTE has a state framework and specific CTE curriculum standards that guide the scaffolded sequence of courses that are offered. In addition, CTE standards have been created to align with and support core academic standards in math, science, social science, and English. And the contextualized learning that students get in CTE co courses often give them another way to connect with those core academic courses or at least support them in those. So if they, maybe they're in their business classes, they might learn to write a business proposal which helps their English, their English skills, their English writing skills. In engineering, they may learn math concepts that they wouldn't maybe learn in a normal math class. Another embedded system to assist ensuring that CTE programs offer high quality, well-rounded academic offerings for students are the 12 elements of high quality CTE programs. These elements are metrics that the state and federal government use to de determine the quality of CTE pathways. Now you'll notice on the graphic, if you look there closely, you go, hey, there's only 11 bubbles there. Um, but last year, CTIG, which is um, the Career Technical Education Incentivized Grant, adopted the 12 elements as part of their guidance for reporting in 2021. And this year, in 2022, Perkins, um, these, and Perkins and C CTIG are both funding sources that we use for our CTE programs, also adopted the 12 elements as well. The newest element, the 12th, is equity, which aligns with the district's push to be equitable in everything that we do. So I'm not going to go over all of the elements. You, guys, you have the handout if you'd like to review them all. But I do want to point out three um, that I think are worth taking a little deeper dive in. The second one, which is the newest, equity. Uh, in CTE, equity needs to be a focus for all opportunities that students in CTE pathways have access to. So there was an earlier discussion about the experiences that students had. So are we making sure that we have more females in our engineering pathways? And not only are we recruiting to them and getting them into those pathways in CTE courses, but are we supporting them along the way so they can be successful? More Latinos or African Americans in computer sciences, groups that have been historically underrepresented, are we, again, supporting them? Are we showing them examples and meeting them with professionals that look like them, that have similar experiences? And when we do this, when we implement with fidelity, CTE equips students with the necessary resources to have the ultimate equity, which is choosing their own post-secondary options. Another one, number eight, data and continuous improvement. Due to being directly linked to industry, which often changes at a much rapid pace than education, CTE is constantly refreshing its curriculum and resources to ensure that students are prepared to meet the current labor market demands. Annual CTE data reporting ensures that pathways employ data-driven practices and drive changes or improvements. Okay. And then number five, skilled instruction informed by professional learning. 
CTE courses are taught by professionals who have industry sector experience and are provided professional development to stay up to date with relevant industry practices. Which then takes me, so and we do that in a variety of ways. We have a lot of professional developments, teacher externships in the summer. There's, um, we offer incentives for uh, teachers to get um, different industry certifications that then they can teach to students, and I'll touch upon that a little later. Which takes me to my next point, who, so who is teaching CTE? Another way that CTE helps to ensure that courses are taught with current industry best practices is the required CTE teaching credential or the designated subject CTE credential. In order for a new CTE teacher to obtain their credential, they must show at least three years worth of specific um, industry work experience. The state counts um, one year as about a thousand hours of verified um, experience and it has to be verified by an industry company or organization and then they must complete a series of credential courses. Industry experience is key, is, it's a key component to having qualified teachers in CTE. Now the flip side of this is that sometimes it can create possible challenge in filling some CTE positions when a CTE teacher, uh, CTE teacher decides to retire or resigns or moves on. Finally, Pathways in, have CTE advisory committees that are made up of Pathways students, staff, and current industry professionals. So they continue to connect with the industry professionals that way. These committees help to continually connect these CTE teachers with up to up-to-date uh, industry trends, practices, and equipment so that CTE courses, the CTE courses that they teach are up to industry standards. So again, because they're, they're changing at a much faster rate than us. So how does this all connect for students beyond the walls of our classrooms? Work-based learning opportunities assist CT students in demonstrating the classroom knowledge they've acquired through mentoring programs, paid internships, pre-apprenticeship programs with industry professionals. So those touch points with ind industry professionals are really, really important. In addition, CT students can acquire certifications specific to industry sectors that align to their pathways. These certifications are set by industry standards and are recognized by industry. So we don't set those. Schools don't create these. Um, these are made by, by the industries. And thus, students can only acquire them by successfully passing an authentic assessment. And the other benefit of these industry um, certifications are that it gives students, uh, gains them entry into industry jobs that other students or even adults wouldn't have access to. It gives them a leg up when they have those. So those go beyond what we teach in, in the school as well. So that is my portion. I know I ran through and I shot a lot of information here very quickly, but if you have any questions, I would be glad to entertain them right now. Yeah, um, I, I don't know if this is the right place to ask this question. I think that it probably isn't, but if, if it's not, maybe somebody else can help me. Where's entrepreneurship in all this? Where is, it's not a profession, uh, it's not a vocation, but it's a, it's a skill set. I tried to match it to some of the other, you know, quest, but it's not any of that. But is there a role for that in what it is that we do? Yeah, there definitely is. Um, in a lot of the pathways, it's embedded within the curriculum. So. Um, it is something that I think we need to continue to look at and, and look at ways to improve. So a lot of our pathways are great at teaching students like culinary, how to, to cook, yeah. um, how, maybe how to make a movie, right? Mm -hmm. But they're not talking about the, how, do you, how do you get the money to do that? So the mm -hmm. entrepreneurship, how do, you, how do you build those, those aspects? Mm -hmm. But what we often do is we'll bring in industry um, partners or professionals that will tell their experience and we'll ask them, hey, can you tell your pathway, how did you get to where you got, and what those experiences in terms of entrepreneurship um, are part of that, that equation in terms of, um, like, I, I built my restaurant doing this. I got this funding. I, I had these partners, or I looked at the economics of, of, uh, of that, not just the core uh, technical skills of, like, how do I cook or make a meal or... Build a, mm -hmm. build a menu, build, build a menu. Or, how, or how do you do a business plan mm -hmm. to, yeah and some of our pathways like MBA the MBA um, pathway at, at Millican is focused on, sure. on, on business so it's so my son is, is someone in there okay. so hopefully he'll learn and manage his money better than I do <laughs>
uh, or, or tell you how he did it so that you can incorporate it into our programs. Yeah. Um, and the second question is uh, about partnerships. I know because of uh, my last education stuff that Long Beach City College has a wonderful CTE program and reputation for that program and, um, uh, and, and moves people around a lot and, uh, and is very connected. Do we work on, and I'm not just talking just about Long Beach City College, but other places besides industry partnerships, are we, are we exploring those things and, and, and how does that work? Yeah, we, we definitely. I actually meet with someone from Long Beach City um, twice, twice a month. Uh, and their work, workforce office. So um, we do have partnerships with Long Beach City College. We're always open, in, open to meeting with um, other community colleges as well, uh, nonprofits as well as uh, for-profit organizations. Um, anything that will expand and, and offer opportunities for students to gain experience. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I know they have that center, Cal State Long Beach has that center for entrepreneurship and, mm -hmm. and I forget what the exact title is, but uh, I know the guy that runs it. and. Uh, uh, it seems to me that there could be some cross fertilization. There, so. And that's also our our work with BESP, the BESP office. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Miller? Yep. Uh, I had a quick question, just more of a clarifying question. So on this slide here, you spoke to the number of students that are in CTE programs. Yep. Uh, can you give me the percentage of high school students that are in CTE programs? I, I can't give that to you off the top of my head because okay. I pulled this from from the from our from our pathways. So okay, but I could get you that information. Got it. That was really it. I was just curious of uh, of the percentage of students that are in high school. What percentage of them are going through one of our our CTE programs in the district? And so. Um, it's just something that I'd be curious about. So if you can give me that number uh, can, later today or sometime during the week, that that would be great. We can definitely do Thank that. Thank you. I have a facilities connection here, Mr. McBride. Okay. So um, from time to time, when we get updates from facilities around cost of projects, um, apart from the cost of materials and supplies, you know, constantly going up, mm -hmm. um, shortages of labor in specific sectors is one of the things that you know, they attribute to the rising cost of projects. So um, part of the vision for when we passed our community workforce development uh, agreement was to sort of create pipelines from our district, right? The vision is that we would have students in our district that would potentially um, have pre-apprenticeship opportunities in high school, mm -hmm. apprenticeship with one of our labor partners, and then would potentially come back and yeah, work right. on projects in Long Beach mm -hmm. that would be high-skilled, well-paid, benefit, uh, benefited industry mm -hmm. uh, job. So I'm wondering where, where our conversations are. I know that we put a pause on many of those because of the pandemic, mm -hmm. but where our conversations are with our labor partners um, and our pathways with regards to these pre-apprenticeship opportunities in sectors, quite frankly, that, you know, that all the data shows that we, are, we have shortages mm -hmm. uh, in here regionally. So, if you could speak to that, Mr. McBride. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll highlight two programs that we have currently. One is with Harbor Freight Tools for Schools that we offer in the summer um, where students, it's a pre-apprenticeship program where they, they get to learn different skills in the construction uh, program. But more specifically, there's another one, the STAR program that we've had at Jordan, and now we're, gonna, we're having it at Cabrillo starting this week, actually, again. And there was a student that actually went through the program years ago and now has been working at the, at the Jordan campus to build the, the campus. And so um, we do have industry partners that are, are dedicated to helping employ our students. They want because they, like you said, they need to fill their, their pipeline, and it's it's better for them to get them here than to try and recruit, you know, from other places. So, we that's always on the forefront of our mind. Like at the, at the end of the day, how can we get these students into well-paying careers um, that will benefit the community and them economically, so they can be independent economically. Independent. Dr. Baker, might might be good opportunity for us to revisit that because we had targets, and then we also allocated for an internship or apprenticeship coordinator uh, for that, right? That would be paid out of the community workforce development. Mm -hmm. uh, it um, also makes me think about just um, Michelle Tomasian's work in business engagement mm -hmm. and 
strategic partnerships, which grew out of her role as Long Beach Call, which was really the office, the intermediary office to connect our high schools to careers and to internships. And so you're asking a lot of questions that kind of branch into that work. And yeah. so we can follow up with something Great. on that Thank topic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions before I call up? No? Good. OK. Um, so then I will call up um, Ed, Ed Samuels. Good morning, everyone. My name is Edward Samuels. I'm from the high school office. Um, and I just have the pleasure of taking what you've learned this morning about pathways and helping you transition to the practical aspects of it. Because when you talk about a high quality pathway, the question is, how do we ensure that that really happens? We have schools with 3,000 kids. You know, we have Wilson that has over 3,500 kids. And one of the graphics that Ms. Shipman shared um, showed one little, uh, there was one bubble in there that said, ensure strong pathway leadership. And so the, the pieces that OCIPD talked about um, are all in place, but they will not be effective without strong pathway leadership. And so at our schools, what we have um, tasked each school to do was to create a pathway leadership team for every pathway. And so, so every pathway has, and let me correct that, pathway triad leadership team. So every pathway has a, a pathway administrator, a pathway counselor, and a pathway lead teacher. And those three individuals are the pathway triad leadership team for each pathway. So that means that a principal doesn't have to take on the task of leading all the pathways at his or her site, especially if you're at a large comprehensive high school, but uh, assistant principals have that opportunity to step in as that pathway administrator um, alongside that principal. And so then the, path, the students within that pathway have much more support. And so I don't want to say too much because we have a, a very effective pathway leadership team here from Wilson High School, and they're going to come and tell you about their work, their role, their responsibilities, um, and they're led by their principal, Ms. Kim Holland. And so we're going to have Ms. Kim Holland come and Ms. Melissa Galbraith and Mr. Rolando Saldivar come and to share what they're doing at Wilson High School. So like Ed said, I'm Kim Holland. I'm the principal at Wilson High School. And this is Rolando Saldivar. Saldivar. He is our head counselor. And Melissa Gal Galbraith is our pathway coordinator. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the roles because we don't function as a triad, the three of us, but we're here kind of representing so that you understand how it works at the school site because now you've kind of over got the overview of how linked learning works. So Melissa, as pathway coordinator, she really leads the work of all of the pathway stuff at Wilson. So she has a monthly meeting where she is actually meeting with all of the pathway triads to then guide us on how we're going to lead the two meetings a month that we have at our school sites. So she comes to pathway coordinator meetings here. She gets that information from district and from the high school office, and then she brings it back to our triads, and then we disseminate that information to our teachers via the triad. So it's really a, an amazing model. I think Renee Shipman is to be commended for her work because she set it up this way. So I came into this model working this way at, at Wilson when I got there three years ago. Of course, then you know the pandemic hit. And, so I'm still learning how it works, but it's, um, it works really well and it's very efficient. And under Melissa's leadership, we have just, um, we've gotten at least two almost gold certified pathways and we're moving uh, the others in towards certification. So we have a structure of five pathways at Wilson High School. We have arts, media, and entertainment. We have uh, Lead, uh, LPS, Leadership and Public Service. We have a technology pathway. We have a biomed pathway. And then we have the WAVE pathway, which you guys kind of talked about. How does that really work? Because it's not the CTE lined. So uh, one of the things that I didn't hear mentioned that I want to make sure I stress is we talked a little bit about equity. And it's really important that you understand that these pathways offer all kids access to things that I don't think they've ever been offered before. So they are all uh, encouraged and able to take AP classes. 
So when you go into an AP class in the technology pathway, you will see kids that probably were never, never had access to that before pathways were uh, introduced in Long Beach. So it's really, uh, it provides an equitable basis for all kids to really have high access to these rigorous classes. So before it was WAVE and everybody else. Now it's everyone gets these, these equitable classes. So when we are designing our master schedule, we're super particular about, we have to make sure we have access to AP in English and all the, every subject has AP access. So it's really um, five small schools within one large, huge 4,000 student school. So um, like Ed was saying, we work as a triad because it's, there's no way me as the principal can oversee all this work. That, and so I really delegate the leadership to these, to my four other assistant principals who really function as a principal over their pathways. So it's really neat because they are then, they have a counselor that works with them and they have a lead teacher who is elected by their peers to lead the pathway work. So that triad together really leads the entire pathway, plans the meetings together, they do, did we flip to the next slide? Oh. <laughs> okay, so we, these triads meet, and there you can kind of see the structure, and they plan two meetings a month. One is focused on learning and teaching, and one is focused on student support. So the learning and teaching meeting is really about professional development. What do we need teachers to know now to move the academics forward? What do we need teachers to know to move the equity work that we're doing at the district level forward? So I disseminate that information to my assistant principals, Melissa, she goes, takes everything from her district meetings and from our meetings, and then she teaches the triads that, and then we go back and plan it with our um, triads, and then we disseminate that information for meetings. So it's really a e equitable, um, we don't, it's not me leading the meetings, it's really I let the lead teacher lead, I let the counselor lead, and a lot of these lead teachers go on to be in the administrative programs because that's something that they're interested in, obviously, is leading. So um, we meet and we develop our pathway action plan for the year, and then we coordinate and facilitate our monthly pathway meetings, like I already said, and then we revise our course of study. So Renee talked about the course of studies and how that supports the master schedule. So at the end of the year, kind of this time actually, we get together and we look at the course of study and we say, do how many kids really want to take this class that's kind of been photography, that randomly is in the arts pathway, but we're only seeing like, you know, 50 kids sign up for it. Do we really need that class? Does that support the pathway work and what the kids really want? So it's really student driven. And when the counselors go around and, and get information from kids, then they will, uh, we kind of get back together and say, well, maybe this class doesn't need to be offered here anymore. It's just not moving the work forward. So uh, Rolando is going to talk to you next kind of about his role as the, count the head counselor but also how the counselor in this triad works. Kim, I'm just going to pause for a minute. I just want to take you back to the beginning of Renee's presentation um, and just give you a glimpse into the past. So this is an innovation that our teams have developed through studying their own work over time and implementing linked learning. It's not um, the case in every district that this, is, that this administrative model is used. Um, and so when Renee started, she talked about the four different parts of linked learning. One of the things that we learned is that we needed to be better about those not operating in isolation. So seeing a lead teacher, and you're gonna hear Melissa talk about her work as lead teacher, Rolando from a counseling perspective, and administrative. So when you think about a master schedule, you heard Dr. Lund talk about middle school master scheduling. The same complexities are, and even are exacerbated when you look at a linked learning approach. And so if the counselor isn't working with the lead teacher and working with the administrator, you don't get coherence and you don't get to gold certification for a linked learning pathway without a, a lot of working together. When you think about interventions for students, a counselor has a key role in assigning and thinking about the coursework of intervention. When you think about implementation of curriculum, the administrator is providing feedback to teachers and ensuring that there is coherence of a program. So this is a really um, exceptional innovation, I think, 
as to, from our own learning about what could better enhance the development of our link learning pathways. So just wanted to yeah. kind of cast to the past um, so that they know how significant what you're doing is. And it's really uh, builds the capacity of the counselors too. We, I mean, using counselors in this leadership role, it gives it empowers them to really build relationships with the teachers and the administrator. I include. Uh, my counselor for my, I'm in charge of the arts pathway because I don't know if you knew that I was a music teacher, so that kind of fits my personality. So I take that on and I lead that with my counselor and then my lead teacher and we plan those meetings, but I also plan the, uh, we develop the master schedule as a team. So it's not just me saying this is who's teaching this and this, we come together and we develop that. So the counselors are all learning how to build a master schedule. My administrative team is learning how to build a master schedule because they are taking their pathway and they are building that master schedule from the ground up each year. So it's, it's really a neat model. All right, Mr. Salva. Yeah, Mr. Sal, well, before you start, I just wanted to applaud because that's exactly what I saw when you were presenting that this is a co-leadership model and I really, I, I know how difficult that can be at times, and uh, but I also know how empowering and how powerful that can be um, from a organizational standpoint. So that, that was really, really impressive to see out the gate and I could hear it uh, even without you having to give it that title. So thank you. Well, good morning everyone and thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to be here. Um, Ms. Holland really talked about the big picture of the triads and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look a little bit more of the specifics and the mechanics of what it really takes to be in that triad and, and pretty much um, work in that triad. So the first thing that we're gonna look at is the relationships and communication. And I like to start by emphasizing that at the core of the success of each of the triads is the relationship and the communication and the strong shared responsibility of leadership. And what does that look like? In the, when we first started this work, um, the, the lead teachers were the ones responsible of leading the pathway. They were the ones responsible of doing the agenda. They were the main people responsible. That seemed to be a little bit overwhelming for some teachers. So now that we have included the uh, administrator, the counselor, and the lead teacher, it really has a vested interest for them to follow through and make sure that, that they meet all those goals, that they meet all the, um, the, the, um, the well, the goals that, 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 the, that the pathway has. Um, the next one is um, the data collection, and with the data collection, um, obviously every single model has to look at data. We have to see what is going on, if it's being effective or not effective. Um, so it's really looking at the, a continual process of spot checking, evaluating, and is it what we are doing? Is it working? Is it not working? So that's, that's pretty much what that data collection uh, process is. Um, so, for example, our uh, public, our, our leadership and public service pathway, what they did is that they looked at the core survey and they looked to see, um, they were looking at school connectedness. And um, basically they wanted to make sure that they increased the school connectedness within their pathway. So what did they do? They developed an action plan. They got a committee together. They got um, all the teachers involved. Um, the teachers got involved with different activities. They did activities during lunch. They did activities in the evening. The counselors got involved by going into uh, the classrooms and doing surveys every quarter just to make sure that we are on track with what, we, what our goals are. Um, so those are the kind of things that it brings kind of like that team mentality of we can do it. It brings in the teachers. It brings in the counselors. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we're talking about with data uh, collection um, and, and having that, 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 that team effort. Um, and the last one is going to be um, meeting planning, um, which is really important because in the past we really looked at the co-teacher just leading that work. Uh, but now um, each person in the triad is an equal co-facilitator that brings their own level of expertise to the table. And um, if it is a student support uh, meeting, then the counselor leads that work. If it is a um, teaching and learning, then the administrator and the lead teacher um, t take over that. So it's really a shared, comprehensive um, way of looking at it. And um, like Dr. Baker, like you, like you mentioned, it is a situation of us learning and making sure that we have these, these things in place. And now um, Ms. Galbraith is gonna go over more in depth. Okay. So 
So as Ms. Holland shared, we are, we're pretty new to Pathways. We are actually year five. We had our first graduating class and we are going to go for our silver certification this year. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> we're going for our silver certification this year, um, which is really exciting. So going through um, the meeting cycle, our triad is really at the core of that work, and that work is distributed amongst them as a cohesive team. So as you can see, we start out with the Pathway Leadership Team Meeting. So um, in my role as Pathway Coordinator, this gives me an opportunity to meet with the Pathway Administrator, the Pathway Counselor, counselor and Lead Teacher from each Pathway to disseminate whatever information I receive, whether it's from you know, my district meetings or at a site level, um, so that they can then bring that back to the Pathways as a whole. This meeting is also used for them to be able to outline their work, so there's some collaborative time um, within this meeting for them to kind of structure what that pathway meeting is going to look like. One thing that is not on the slides and we have not talked about today, which I think is really important, is I call it a fourth layer to our pathway leadership team, and that is student voice. So as pathway coordinator, I am lucky enough to be able to teach a class. Um, it is our pathway student ambassadors. They are a phenomenal group of students who keep me very, very busy. Um, and we have asked them to come to our pathway leadership team meeting and bring that student voice or input or feedback to the pathways before we start planning that pathway meeting. They've also come as I'll get to our pathway meetings and shared with the pathway as a whole. So I just wanted to add that because I think it's really key. So we have our pathway leadership team meeting and then that brings us down to our pathway triad meetings. So after we leave that meeting, our triads then get together and they decide you know, if it is a student support meeting and I am the counselor, I'm going to be responsible for pulling data. If we're looking at DNF or we're looking at interventions, the counselor will take the lead um, in that work. If it is um, a learning and teaching meeting, maybe our administrator is going to bring in some of the observation data from visiting classrooms, what they see around industry integration. So everybody plays a key role. It is not, as Mr. Saldivar pointed out, the lead teacher doing all the work and running the meeting. Also, um, at the triad meeting, they really plan out and are intentional in who is presenting what at the pathway meetings. So everybody has an active role within the pathway meeting. So once they have the structure planned, um, we have our pathway meetings. So ideally it should be twice a month, um, obviously with the pandemic and um, some of the challenges coming back this year, meeting structure has changed somewhat, but it should be really twice a month. And we follow a cycle, which is learning and teaching focus and a student support focus. So um, our, I mentioned our lead teacher, our counselor and administrator all facilitate this meeting. But I also wanna point out that we have teacher experts. So we talked about the tech core. Those are our industry ac experts. So if we're talking about learning and teaching and we want to see more industry integration happening in classrooms and more relevancy for our students, um, who better than to have our tech core teachers as our industry experts then share some of that work, some of that PD, if you will, within that meeting. So it's not just the triad. We also bring our students, our teacher experts. It could be around instruction, sharing work-based learning experiences. We have an algebra teacher who brought in someone. Um, so you said the long title. It was Long Beach Call. Sorry. I, I'm blanking. <laughs> And to, thank you. So working with that office, uh, yeah, the long, the long one. Um, working with that office, he just wanted to bring in relevancy for his students around calculus. And so he brought in um, someone who worked on that project who showed the students um, you know, this is where, where we use this in the real world. And this is where we use this when we made that bridge in your community. Um, and so that teacher then came back to his pathway at a pathway meeting and was able to share how easy it was and just the how to, to give those experiences to our students. Um, and then that brings us to something new for Wilson this year, which is our grade level meetings. So with the assistance of Ms. Shipman last year, and the master scheduling experts over here, we were able to fit in a common conference grade level planning time for our core teachers within each pathway. So once a month, our teachers will be able to come together within their pathway core um, to 
focus on different things. So for example, I'm thinking at the start of this year, um, the focus was bringing students back. Like, what are the needs of our students if I'm a ninth grade biomed teacher um, for math? You know, what, what in our academic core, what do, or what do we have consistent for our student experience, our homework policies, our um, grading policies, and also mapping out. So it gives them a chance to map out. I'm doing this huge project in March. Student feedback is we get a lot of stuff at once. So this gives them an opportunity to really be able to map out where their projects and exams are to really help our students not to feel overwhelmed. Um, and right now our focus for grade level planning is our, our uh, industry multidisciplinary multi integrated projects. So looking at our projects that are focused on our industry theme that students will work on through their academic core. Um, it was a challenge for us to find time to be able to really go deep with that, um, and we've now been able to do that, having the grade level meeting time carved out for that work. So this is, in a nutshell, really how our triads work together, um, along with, as I mentioned, our pathway teams. Can you mention the advisory boards? Oh, yes. So a big student feedback. Um, we finally were able to launch last year two advisory boards. So we launched our LPS advisory board, and we launched our biomed advisory board. Um, I feel like there was a feeling of, we don't have enough people yet, we don't have enough people yet, we don't have enough, it's just like, we, we have some, so let's just do it. And when we did, we had our advisory board meeting virtually. Um, it was, well, I know, you know, this lawyer at this office, and I know this court reporter, and so it just, through those, it's, it's really building out, through the connections of just doing that work. Um, we also launched our tech advisory board, and there was a question about entrepreneurship. Through our advisory board, we, through our tech advisory board, um, our students led the first advisory board meeting and just shared their experience and the student outcomes and what they love and what they wish they had more of. And our advisory bo board partners agreed to come to Wilson and ha host a, have a panel, be on a panel. And so it gave our students opportunities to hear, well, I went to school for this and these are the skills I wish I had in high school and now I started, you know, four different startup companies and these are the skills that I needed to do that. So um, the advisory boards is guiding the work around our student outcomes, looking at are these the skills, are these current, is this really what we want when our students graduate, looking at our course of study, um, specifically some of the certifications we were considering for our School of Technology. Um, they had some great recommendations that, wow, if you came out with this certification, you would be above and beyond other graduates. So the advisory board, um, it's new, but it, we're already really able to get some valuable information and partnerships, so we're building out those partnerships as well through our advisory boards. Thank Any you. questions for us, they're good? Any questions, colleagues? Um, <clears throat> I have a question about the advisory boards. So um, who facilitates those meetings? So I work with the triad and our Pathway Student Ambassadors. So when we first had an, our first meeting, it was before we were back and it was um, all virtuals, which was very nice because as we know, Wilson doesn't have um, a lot of parking. So people could just <laughs> jump on. There were some people who were still in the office and our Pathway Ambassadors really led the actual meeting. The planning was the triad as well as the ambassadors. So they were able to share their experience, what it means to be in a pathway, what they love about the pathway, their favorite class, why, the outcomes. Um, and also, our, our ambassadors are juniors and seniors. So what do they wish, we're, we were still new, right? We just had our first graduating class. So what is something they wish they had more of? And how can those partnerships with our industry partners fill that for, for our future? And, and how are the students chosen to be ambassadors? There's an application process. So as they're doing their course selections, if they are interested in becoming a Pathway Ambassador, their junior or senior year, they have to fill out our application. Our triad will review the applications for each Pathway specific, and then we blind, you know, we put the name out for our ambassadors, and we ask our ambassadors if they think, you know, who they think have the characteristics to fill their spot when they graduate. The majority of our 11th grade ambassadors come back again as senior ambassadors. Mm, thank you. 
I, I think this is more of a question for you. Is the advisory board model just something that's being used at Wilson, or is this used at all of the uh, pathways? They're a part of all of our high schools. They all should have, all should have advisory boards. Actually, when you say all the high schools have advisory boards, would that be advisory boards for each pathway individually? Yes. Oh, okay, because I know, um, I know uh, several years ago at Lakewood High School there was a business advisory board, and that was not pathway specific, but it was for the um, school. But now it's by pathway. That's nice. Thank you all. Very informative. Um, yes, great job. Question for Mr. Dr. C. Brown. <laughs> uh, actually, I should ask how many gigawatts do we need for the flex capacitor to oh, work? Oh. <laughs> uh, that actually took longer than I thought to get there. That was good. <laughs> um, so one of the things that we heard emphasized this morning was equity all right, in our pathways. And it's a common thread from yesterday's presentations. Could we get? Uh, Chris, the subgroup breakdown, uh, including students with disabilities, of who's in what pathway? Yes, we okay. can. Thank you. Um, colleagues, yesterday we went a little bit longer, uh, and it was a great opportunity for us to uh, engage in more questions and discussions, and because of that, it pushed back our morning uh, a little bit longer. So one of the things that Dr. Baker and I touched base briefly on yesterday, um, since it's only an information item, our um, governance community visioning piece today, we were thinking of adding that to tonight's agenda so that we would have enough time for our facilities update this morning. So I wanted just to make you aware of that so that we're not uh, you know, as tight for time uh, this morning since we you know, go into subcommittee meetings later this afternoon. So I wanted to share that with you since it's only an info item, we'll push that back and that'll give us some time here for our facilities update. So are we ready to go with that? OK, thank you. Let's do a five-minute break then.
everyone. We are returning to our board workshop this morning. Uh, Mr. Miranda, thank you for being here. Just a quick footnote, Mr. Miranda, so we're already running a little bit behind. Any slides that you feel you can go faster through than others, uh, as you know, we have another part of this presentation coming in. Not to rush you, but we have the slides in front of us. We've had them in advance. Uh, so just want to make sure that we're mindful of time this morning as well. So good morning, members of the board, Superintendent Baker, executive staff, and our wonderful audience here in person and watching at home. Um, David Miranda, Director of Facilities, really happy that we're allotted this time slot to be able to present a facilities update. It's got several sections and components to it, so even though I'm speaking to the majority of them, uh, I don't have the highlight. The highlight's going to be at the tail end where we call up Alan Rising, who you guys are all familiar with on the business services side of the house, and a number of students who are joining us from the Green Schools campaign as well. So I've presented with students in the past via board workshops. I'm going to do so again today. This will not be the last time. I'll probably do so at some point in the future because they shine. They do a great job, of course. So first off, in typical fashion, we always like starting off with a building program update. This is primarily going to be based on bond funded work, but I am going to sprinkle in a few other projects that are larger in scale that I just want to bring to the board's attention and community's, community's attention. It, it's just great things that are going on in Long Beach, of course. So starting off with recently completed work, uh, what you see pictured here is a typical classroom over at Bryant Elementary. This project was the most recent in terms of projects that have gone through our HVAC scope of work. Again, that includes new heating and, and air conditioning systems, but also other cosmetic type improvements just to bring in natural light as best we can, uh, enhance technology in classrooms, have new flooring and finishes and, and paint and lighting and whatnot. You see a number of those things pictured on that top image. The other thing I want to draw your attention to is the old furniture that's pictured in there. Just keep that in mind as we transition deeper into the presentation. I'm going to tie that loose end up within a few slides. So you also see pictured down below Lowell, a, a new lunch shelter or shade structure. I want to highlight not just the completed work because it looks fantastic out there, but we're also embarking on a number of shade structure type improvement projects district wide really. So ESSER funded shade structures, uh, facilities is spearheading the implementation, but we're really working hand in hand in collaboration and coordination with other departments in the district to be able to deliver those, those projects. Uh, you see Lakewood High School track and field highlighted at the, at the bottom of the bullet points there, but we wanted to give it its own slide and, and just highlight the before and after images. We feel that gives it a little more justice. What I would sh share with everybody here and at home, you, you need to get out there and see it firsthand. So you, what you see pictured is the old scoreboard right next to the new scoreboard. Um, you see really what we tried to do, which is take a picture from the very exact same spot on the bleachers uh, p before the project broke ground. And then you see what we took there just a few weeks ago. So the field is now officially turned over to the school site. Uh, we hear there's an alumni event that's going to be hosted out there on the 26th just to really break ground and officially um, open the facility. But it's open. There's student use out there now as well. Looks fantastic. I'm not much of a runner, but I feel like I can run a whole heck of a lot faster on that track. A number of construction projects that are in the active stage, right? So these are shovels in the ground, cons construction workers, subcontractors working currently uh, as we speak, right? Just at various locations throughout the district, hitting different regions of the district boundary and different type of projects. So we have our slate of HVAC projects that are, most of them are actually coming to a close at the end of this summer. So we have work going on at Robinson, we have work at Twain, we have work over at Wilson as well. Those are all coming close to, to, to fruition, right? So we're, we're nearing completion there. There were all several multifaceted phases that were included in each of those projects, but things are looking good. Con contractors continue to do good top-notch work for us. What you see pictured there on the image on the top left is uh, Jordan High School. So there's always quite a bit of work that happens behind the scenes, right? Underground. So we see, uh, you know, wood framing and things that go once we get sticks out of the ground. Uh, but there's quite a bit of work that happens underground just to make sure we're on solid footing before we even pour building foundations. And that's really what you see pictured here. You know, based on where we are ge geographically, the water table's at a certain height here, there's always a number of things we have to do just to make sure we're structurally sound and buildings are safe and they're here for the long haul. It's really what you see, some of, the, some of that work in progress there. The other picture you're, uh, I would draw your attention to is the picture on the right, which is Lakewood High School's gym. And of course, you see, that's one of the most exciting phases of construction for us, which is demolition phase. 
It goes fast. It goes hard. It's a little messy. Uh, but you really see how we go to town and, and really break ground on projects, uh, really on, in day one and day two. Uh, so that project was uh, sectioned off from the general modernization scope of work for that particular campus, and we're now embarking on that work today. So it's also going to get HVAC, the technology-based improvements that we embark on as part of the Measure E bond program. But, of course, it's going to get a new gym floor. Um, new bleachers, new lighting as well, just to make that facility modern uh, for students and staff in the community going forward. The last bullet point there is electronic door locks. I, I've briefed the board on where we are with respect to that project. It was set it up as a pilot project to start out in four schools. Uh, we've completed two of them over at Bigsby and Muir. Um, Robinson is in progress. We, we're basically doing the Robinson electronic door lock scope of work in conjunction with the HVAC work. Just makes sense to not inconvenience the site on multiple occasions. And then Jefferson is on the slate as well. We, you know, the, there was conversation earlier with respect to actually some topics and subtopics we covered a few months ago. Supply chain issues, um, cost of materials going up, labor shortages in the construction field as well. And we are seeing some of that. So I, I highlight that now because with electronic door locks, it's likely going to take us a little longer even just to, to receive the materials. So we'll continue to collaborate and communicate with the school sites who could be impacted. Um, regardless, we're excited about the project. We've laid out good, a good game plan and scope of work. It, now it's just playing a little bit of a waiting game to make sure we procure and receive the materials before installation. Several projects in the planning stages, right? So as we're finishing things off, there's a number of projects in the ground. There's a number of projects, you know, behind the scenes in the planning and developmental stage. And you see several listed here. So Avalon is now officially underway in terms of their HVAC and modernization scope of work. They're a few months into construction and so far so good. Uh, but the field project is slated to break ground next year. So in January, we're slated to start work on their actual um, synthetic turf field, which is super exciting for all of us. You see a few projects listed there in terms of the next batch of HVAC um, modernizations that we're going to embark on. We recently hosted a series of community meetings for each of those projects as well. Um, good questions, good, uh, good attendance from the crowd as well, so I'm happy that folks were able to jump in and join us just to learn a little more about the project as it's coming forward. Hamilton's gym is scheduled to break ground. We're still in the design stages there and planning stages, but we are tentatively scheduled to break ground later this year. So I'd say towards the end of the calendar year for Hamilton. Keller's locker room building is actually uh, in the bid phase right now. So that one's actually um, out of the state architects with, with final approval for the plans and specifications. We're looking at breaking ground relatively soon here, uh, but the bid process in and of itself does take about a month or two uh, before we bring forth a, a, a contractor recommendation to the board. Then, of course, we have some aquatic center projects um, deep into the design and collaboration phase. You know, at a previous board meeting, we discussed how we're going to gather a little more input, and, and that's pretty much where we are. So we've set forth a good game plan with respect to gathering additional feedback. We'll get that feedback and return to the board and, and present our next steps relatively soon. Um, there was conversation previously with respect to our community workforce development agreement as well. Uh, we've highlighted the fact that Jordan Phase 2B and that new building is the first project uh, resulting from that project list. I just wanted to highlight that Wilson and Lakewood Aquatic Centers would be number two and number three respectively. So those are coming forward. I do envision, because we had some conversations with our trade partners early on, in terms of bringing on uh, the coordinator type position and some of these other collab collaborative uh, efforts. At that point in time, and COVID did push us a little sideways, um, but we did have planned efforts with respect to having deeper dialogue and kicking off those efforts as we roll closer to project number two and number three on the list, which is right now. So we'll continue to dialogue. Actually, we'll reach out to the trade partners really soon here and return back with deeper updates there. And then Jordan phase three, uh, just for the community's benefit, is the HVAC and modernization scope of work scheduled for the science building out on that campus. So that's our three-story building. It's front and center, really, a, a, you know, you can't miss the building, right? It's right at the center of the campus. It's a large building. So we will go forth with our traditional scope of work, but we are also looking at a few things just kind of from an aesthetic standpoint. Uh, the building's such a highlight, such a focal point, you know, it's very highly visible. So we figure there's probably a few cleanup efforts we can include or have the architects include 
just to make it a little more visually appealing as well. So we're doing that. Switching gears. So I want to talk a little bit about furniture and take us back to that image we shared just a short while ago with the older stuff. So we won't have to see any more of those images for too much longer, uh, which is super exciting for us. You know, we kicked off a large scale effort uh, to really get the right folks in the room and get quite a bit of feedback with respect to where we should go with these large scale furniture efforts as we're trying to replace classroom furniture in every classroom in the district over the course of the next couple of years. So of course, we, we put together a committee. We had a number of different stakeholders in there, a good cross-representation of different district department representatives, uh, number of teachers in the room, level office representation as well, um, folks from the operations side of the house, because there's impacts everywhere you look, right? So what we heard resulting from that committee was a number of key words. So we heard, look, we want things and, and furniture and equipment that gives us mobility and flexibility. We want durability. We want this stuff to last quite a long time. Most importantly, we heard functionality though. So uh, we worked hand in hand with um, folks who are actually working on our master plan, Canon Design. Uh, there's Devin in the back of the room there representing Canon a and really working closely with the Canon folks because they've embarked on and spearheaded these type of efforts for other clients and other districts really across the nation. So we wanted to get some feedback from the experts in the room as well. They quarterbacked a few meetings for us uh, along the way uh, just to kind of spearhead that effort for us, and it was helpful. So ultimately, we landed um, in a place where we found products we wanted to pilot. Um, we went forward with such a pilot at the TK level and K level over winter break. Um, uh, you know, we secured quite a bit of feedback there, overwhelmingly positive, right? So we're super happy with how those particular sites turned out and that really started serving as a roadmap for what TK and K classrooms could look like district-wide. Um, so that was part of the planning efforts and that took us really to the end of the calendar year last year. This year our focus has been on developing that full game plan, right? So what do things look like going forward before we absolutely hit the ground running to be able to hit our mark? So lots of planning, lots of engagement and talking to additional folks. Uh, we have what I would describe as a nine phase schedule to be able to achieve this and implement it district wide over the course of the next couple years. What we're looking at over the course of the summer in phase one is TK and K classrooms um, at every elementary school and, and implementing that over the summer stretch. But what we also foresee and predict in, in development of that schedule is continued efforts and implementation year round. Uh, we will not be able to achieve this if we only target winter breaks or summer breaks. So we'll have some help on hand to be able to help us coordinate these efforts and work through the logistics and communicating with folks. But it's a large effort, for sure. Uh, when all said and done, we're projected to finish um, the last phase in the summer of 2024. So quite a bit of work. Uh, I'll continue to update folks, um, bring forth pictures and, and additional feedback as we secure it. it. It's just really exciting for all of us. Dave, can I just add, just to um, put a pin on this, this is an investment in the learning acceleration and support plan that is, that is from Pillar 4, the infrastructure for the future. And so it's, it's given us an opportunity to make a, a huge investment with those ESSER funds um, to the tune of about $45 million for, for the infrastructure for the future and coordinated through the facilities office. Perfect. Yes, yeah, right. a naive question about uh, planning for TK and K on all elementary school campuses. With declining enrollments, um, how, do, how, do you, how do you work that? And uh, uh, we're declining not only because people in the upper grades aren't, aren't there, because people are, but, but at the lower grades too. And how does that work? How does that planning work? In really collaboration, right? So collaboration with our folks in the elementary school office, Mr. Mr. Mos Moskovitz and other folks in the district as well, uh, looking at enrollment projections. Uh, you know, we do need a starting point though. So we look yeah. at current enrollment with each respective school site. We've looked at a, a, a factor, basically let, let's, let's furnish every one of these current classrooms as they're occupied today, but add in a 10% factor as well. Because we do always want to keep some flexibility sure. and be able to move and maneuver furniture back and forth among school sites. We are looking at standardizing products, right? So if one school in the district happens to grow and another one declines, we can move things around as well. So we've built in some flexibility there. 
Um, and as best we can, we've worked with Mr. Mr. Moskovitz in his office to project TK enrollment. We actually have a meeting right after this to talk a little further uh, with respect to game planning there. Difficult task, but, but something we've put a lot of effort into. I won't spend much time on this slide, but it really highlights our pilot sites. Uh, just wanted to reference the fact that we have pilots at each respective level. Uh, so we're looking at elementary pilots, secondary pilots as well. Uh, we are going to extend invites to other teachers and administrators in the district to be able to stop in and visit any one of these given pilot sites to be able to look at the furniture and give us feedback. We'll also put forth a survey, right, because there could be teachers in the district who have, you know, actually had some of this type of classroom furniture even in under other districts, right? So we want their feedback regardless based on what they know and what they've experienced. You see a few pictures here. So a majority of the images are actually taken from the TK pilot sites that we embarked on over the winter break. Um, and, and you see some of those components there that I described, right? The functionality, the mobility, majority of those components have casters and wheels, right? So you're able to kind of maneuver them around and configure them every which way, which is just super neat. Uh, the images down below to the right are over at Browning. So we have already um, basically housed some of our pilot furniture out there. The, the rest of it's slated to come in later this month. So as soon as that's in place, we'll extend those invites to administrators and teachers to be able to pop in, give us direct feedback um, before we absolutely hit the ground running going forward. Brief update on surplus properties. Uh, this is a topic I haven't addressed in a few months, so I figured I'd share where we are uh, with respect to timeline. Again, just for reference sake, that's two properties. They've been vacant for several years. These are non-education, non-school site properties in the district. Um, so just, again, just to tee up the rest of the conversation. Where we left things off was our public agency offering, which is something we're mandated to do per ed code. We completed those efforts, reached out to a number of different agencies, ultimately determined there was not interest in purchasing the properties off of the district. We then embarked on the state waiver process to, to give us the ability to, to engage in the services of, of a broker to really generate interest in the properties but also to allow us to include a community good component as part of our rating criteria before we uh, agree uh, on an ultimate price with a developer. So where we are now is on the calendar and on the slate for a May state board meeting. So originally we targeted March. Uh, they only meet quarterly to go over these type of uh, approvals. We were hopeful for March, but we got pushed off into May. Uh, that did allow us to collaborate and talk to a whole number of other folks as well. Uh, the waiver process also requires that we reach out to representation on the Taub side of the house, just to make sure they're engaged and know what's going on with respect to surplus properties and the waiver efforts in particular. Also allowed us to re-engage with our asset management committee. It, it had been quite a while since we talked to those folks, and I'm glad they were readily available and met with us to, just to gauge where we are in the process and volunteer based, right? So we're just super happy they continue to be available to us in that respect. Uh, the properties have been vacant. We continue to have a presence in terms of security and visiting regularly. Uh, maintenance and operations continues to go out there just to make sure things are tidied up and the properties retain their value as best we can. So we're gonna continue to do both of those things. Uh, we might even ramp up our efforts because we anticipate we're gonna have more eyes out there via brokers and interested parties. So we'll probably do a few more things on the cleanup side of the house, just to make sure we get the best bang for the buck as a district. What we started working on also just in parallel was the development of the RFP for the broker. So we figured once we get that waiver, we can go in parallel, we don't waste any time, right? So we could be out for market as soon as this summer. So before I really switch gears and, and go into kind of the meat of the presentation, I figure this is a good pausing point for any questions with respect to what I just described. If not, we'll keep powering through. Mr. Miller? Yeah, my question's really quick. Uh, you were talking about the three um, projects that are on our... Um, Community Workforce Development correct. Agreement? Correct. Yes. You knew I was going there with it. <laughs> uh, can you give us an update on the apprenticeship coordinator? Or I know you talked a little bit about it, but I just wanted a little bit more. Yeah, so, so next steps, we, we sort of put it on pause for a little while, only because mm -hmm. we wanted to ramp up a few more projects, right? Yeah. And, and we felt that was fair for the Trade Council and our trade partners. Mm -hmm. Let's roll out a few additional projects that will we'll engage in that conversation. 
So I think really next step for us, Mr. Miller, is to make those phone calls and have those meetings, uh, work with other folks in the district as well to roll out that very position. We've yet to do so. Got it. Yeah, and once again, just to give you precedence on why I'm so interested, I think there are great full-time job opportunities in these projects and getting some of our district kids involved in this work with the assistance of a liaison like an apprenticeship coordinator I think would be great. So Absolutely. The sooner we can get that done, the better. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you for all of the updates. And I, I think we're going to cover this in um, – potentially in our facilities master plan or I assume that we are uh, but one of your pictures triggered a conversation that I've had uh, with some teachers specifically around as we're doing this this facilities master plan we you know the through line through all of our work obviously is equity um, and how our facilities um, the age that they are the locations that they are the neighborhoods that they serve and the way they were designed sometimes 80 90 years ago um, and meeting the needs from a facility standpoint um, but I was looking at the picture on your planned projects and it's um, one of our schools that has green space I left it in here so it's this one with the green space in the front and I know we just uh, did a lot of work around making sure our campuses were secure and safe but we know that some of our schools like this one were designed where the green space is on the outside and so for students who head to recess and when they head to recess, it's on blacktop, and there's this beautiful tree and green space outside of their classroom. Would really like for us to consider, and I'm throwing this out here as we head into the facilities master plan so that you can, can touch on some things that might be in there or how we continue to plan. The idea that, that green space is uh, hard to find in some of our schools, and some of it was placed on the outside for either safety or aesthetic reasons, but ways that we bring that learning space into the fold for some of our schools um, in a way that is safe for them to be out there maybe during recess or during classroom time and use that space. Um, so I'm throwing that out there from the wanting to infuse equity into everything that we do as we frame that conversation that there may be things that you know in your head that you can drop in uh, along the way that um, start to address even some of those as we do this planning process for the next six months. That's perfect. So it wasn't part of my sleep, but I can go there. <laughs> so why don't I do so in this very ne next slide? Okay. So again, switching gears, going into the facility master plan, which is just a large scale effort, is really gonna take up the better part of a year when all is said and done, right? We engaged in the services uh, of bringing on a professional service firm, Canon Design, who I've highlighted in the room. They started their work in August and really hit the ground running with respect to building assessments, right? Infrastructure needs, walking, physically walking every campus and every space in the district. And they did that over the summer, uh, just figuring there's no students, there's not as much staff around, let's not interrupt and disrupt what's going on in the district. And they did a great job there. They then, then switched gears um, and, and really helped us set forth a number of different committees. So we touched, up, we touched on the furniture committee. There's also the sustainability committee, which I'll highlight in a few seconds here. Um, but there's other folks we've engaged with just to get more dialogue and, and to get conversations rolling, right? So be it Tisby, just to really gauge tech needs going forward. The maintenance side of the house, so we can talk about maintenance needs and where we have trouble in certain parts of the district or with certain older buildings. And those engagement efforts have been very good to date. So we're gonna continue to do so and get more dialogue and get more folks in the room so we can get just all this feedback built into this comprehensive plan. Coincidentally, me and Alan just wrapped up a presentation about a month ago via a statewide conference on facility master planning. So we really stress the importance of facility master plans, how each master plan in each respective district is a little different, right? Sometimes it's just a small scale update where you're looking at cost implications. In many other cases, it's a large scale, full and comprehensive new master plan, which is what we're doing here. So this is a comprehensive plan. We're taking a deep dive into assessing needs today, you know, uh, assessing what we've done to date, but also really identifying what we should do next and what those priorities start to look like. Um, what I can highlight here is just kind of teasing what, what some of those priorities are, are looking like to date, what, how they're taking shape. Uh, what we project going forward, just in terms of some major buckets, is really continued efforts uh, via HVAC and modernization. So there's still several schools in the district where we need to embark on those type of projects and do so, if anything, just to become more efficient, 
right? So there were several schools that are not part of the current bond program because there was a good conscious decision at the time that those schools really were towards the top of the list, right? They had HVAC systems in place. They were working just fine. Now, of course, those are older schools, right? And they'll continue to get older. They'll continue to become a little more inefficient too as, he, as, as each day passes, really. So we do see that as one of the larger buckets that still remains in terms of potential future work. We've also identified a number of school sites that have what I would describe as 20 plus portables or bungalows still sitting out there. So the, those really scream to us as wanting to be something different, uh, be it new buildings. In many cases, we can likely build two story buildings to build up and pick up some more footprint for play space, right? So we can kill a few birds with one stone there. We know there's additional tech based improvements that are gonna be needed out there. Um, but I'm glad you referenced green space because that, that's jumping off the page to us. Devin is smiling at the back of the room because we've talked about that quite a bit. So there are schools that we know do not have green space right now, uh, whether it's outside of the building footprint or inside the campus, right? So we know green has to be a component, right? We need play space. Um, we need space even for just outdoor learning as well. So uh, again, we can check off a few boxes just by reconfiguring things and creating new spaces within our campus footprints. That's gonna be a priority. Uh, you know, we'll continue with these master planning efforts and more engagement and hearing from other folks, but those four categories just right out the gate uh, are already jumping off the page to us. And a whole lot more, by the way. <laughs> and if I could just follow up, I mean, you're talking about those end of life HVAC schools, mm -hmm. and, and we know that those schools in the 90s due to 100,000 kids in this district, mm -hmm. Um, were in our most impacted, densely populated areas anyway. So they were probably schools that didn't have a lot of green space to begin with. So yes. while that upgrade was appreciated in the late 90s, um, those are end of life, as you're saying, and they don't have green space, and they weren't part of the plans. And so making sure that we're circling back uh, with those schools who were most impacted back then to do that restorative work so that going forward they have more opportunities is really super important, so thank you. Absolutely, now the other piece that's really coming out of these conversations is we still have quite a bit to do. So there's quite a few building needs out there, infrastructure needs, just program-based needs, right? Where we need the right facilities to be able to offer up certain programs. There was a lot of conversation about career tech, right? We know as we visit school sites, we're able to do so and do so efficiently and adequately if we have the right space. So that, that's gonna come at the forefront of this master plan effort as well. Wanted to finish on this Just slide. Just added to that, Mr. Miranda. So, um, also conversations around, um, you know, full service community schools, right? Programming after school, programming on the weekends, and as we engage in those conversations, just how to maximize the most of our schools, because oftentimes the schools are the only place, all right, in those neighborhoods. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. The master plan will help us get there too. So it'll help us set a roadmap for what these buildings look like, where on the campus should these buildings be if they're new buildings perhaps, right? So maybe within closer proximity to a front entry, uh, to a parking lot perhaps, just to make sure they really serve the community as a whole. So right on. Um, so with this slide, the last point I wanted to make was with respect to just continued engagement efforts. So our next step is really to seek out uh, community feedback. So uh, I referenced a number of departments we've tapped into, we've talked to school site folks, but now we really want to open the doors to community feedback. So we're going to have a community-based forum at the end of this month, uh, um, Thursday the 31st over at Browning at 6 o'clock. We'll really open the doors and extend an invite to our entire Long Beach community for folks who want to attend the session and just give us feedback with respect to needs that they see at school sites, priorities they would want to kind of push forth, and, and additional comments. We're also gonna set up a Saturday session because we know there's working parents who perhaps cannot attend a Thursday session. So in late April, we're gonna set up a Saturday workshop also at Browning during the daytime. I, I think we targeted 10 a.m. Just to again, hit those parents, hit those community folks who perhaps could not attend the Thursday session. So really putting ourselves out there um, to secure as much feedback as possible. And still on track in terms of having information we can put forth in front of the board for consideration in the summertime. So just wanted to highlight that piece as well. Switching gears here, so sustainability committee, and I'll just take a couple of these slides and then we're gonna have Alan Rising, our business services administrator, um, speak to some, some efforts we've embarked on as a district to date. Um, we'll then have a number of students uh, speaking from the Green Schools campaign. So we have Diana and Emma and Rajan, so it, it'll be cool to get them up here. You can hear directly from them as well. Uh, but I just wanted to tee up the conversation at this point. So. 
we set forth on, on this large effort with the creation of a st sustainability committee. Uh, again, just to gauge you know, and, and gather feedback and talk to folks um, and, and identify potential priorities going forward as well. So again, a good cross-representation from different departments and different folks in the district, a lot of stakeholders who are external to the district. Uh, we referenced um, that the Green Schools campaign has been a large part of this committee. What I would share is we've had a number of meetings to date, so we've had three specific meetings. They've all been via Zoom. Um, each session has been at least an hour, if not an hour and a half. And we hit the ground running via every one of those little workshops, we call them. So Canon does a good job of quarterbacking the sessions for us. Uh, they serve as a technical expert, so they can really do a good job in that respect. Um, but the students have just shined. So we have a number of different folks in the committee. But in many cases, I'll come back to the office and talk to my counterparts and my colleagues that are part of the facilities team. And we often share, look, we just kind of sit back and listen because they're saying such great things, right? So we've put the students front and center. In fact, we invited a few additional students via the last workshop just to get some more student voice in the room. So it's been super beneficial. Some of the slides you see pictured up here are, are directly a result from those conversations. So you see our little notes and our scribbles and highlighting certain things. Many of these exercises have gone at a very fast pace, like five minutes per segment, just to keep the conversation moving because we're trying to tackle so many different points. Uh, the next slide really demonstrates and highlights how there's so many layers to this conversation as well. So we talk quite a bit about electrical demands and electricity in general, but the conversations have really gone down the path of, of water and recycling and just food, right? So whether it be waste or just other ways we can go about doing things in the district. So just very good dialogue to date. And with that, I'll ask Alan to work his way up here and speak to some efforts here in the district. Great, thank you, Dave. <clears throat> so I will uh, keep my comments pretty quick because I know I'm acutely aware that I'm standing in the way of some uh, very energetic young folks that wanna come up and, and talk to you about sustainability goals. But I think it's important to frame the conversation with some of the successes that our district is currently doing and some of the work that we've been doing over the last few years towards our ultimate sustainability goals. So to start with, it's overriding kind of overall, overall policy, uh, our energy policies as we look to help to uh, curb demand and, and to be very efficient with the, with the energy that we do at our, our school sites. So we, we work continuously on our energy policies to ensure we do things like what are our set points, those have been conversations, and when do we turn air conditionings on and off and how we control those. So those are all part of our overall energy policy that is ongoing. Uh, Prop 39 has been a big success for us. That gave us about $19 million statewide that we were able to implement uh, various different energy conservation efforts across the district. Uh, and that program will be ending this coming June. So we're closing it out now as we're finalizing those final reports back to the state and currently going through an audit of that program with the state level. We have a new program which is called AB 841. This is a, an HVAC efficiency uh, program that's providing us uh, much less money, somewhere around $2.8 million is what we're eligible for to help us uh, ensure that our HVAC systems are working as efficiently as possible to provide the healthiest air into our, into our uh, uh, classroom spaces as well as ensure the equipment is operating at peak efficiency so we are uh, we've currently applied for our first phase of that and we will uh, look forward to uh, being able to implement those improvements at our school site uh, we've also been able to this year uh, uh, thank you to dr. Baker is to is to hire a sustainability program specialist uh, Christy McFagan who is with us here today uh, she uh, has a core responsibility to work with our school sites and work with our, our teacher groups and our student groups to, in, to implement sustainability programs and to work with them with, re, with recycling and other types of programs at our school sites. So she's been instrumental to helping to move this effort forward as well. But continuing with other, other successes, our solar carports, our, so, our, our power generation, we currently are producing about 9.2 megawatts of on-site generation at our school sites, which is saving us uh, in excess of half a million dollars a year in ongoing energy costs and increasing, because as we know, rates continue to go up 
And as rates go up, our, our cost avoidance also goes up uh, as we don't have to pay those higher energy bills. Uh, we conducted a, a, an entire series of indoor lighting retrofits. That was a very successful program, thank you to Prop 39, that ended up saving us about 3.2 megawatts of power. When you think about how much we save just in our interior lighting, it's quite significant. That alone uh, gave us ongoing savings of about $650,000 to our, to our general fund each year moving forward, and as I said, going up. Uh, thermostats, our energy management system, our ability to control uh, one of our most costly uh, features, which is our HVAC equipment, uh, that is saving us somewhere around a half a megawatt, about 500,000 kilowatts uh, per year, just in the, in the ability to control and turn off our systems uh, when they're not needed and they're not, not providing uh, uh, conditioned spaces to our, to our classrooms. Uh, we also have our recycling programs, largely been grassroots. We've worked with some groups at school sites, uh, but with our sustainability efforts and some of the requirements of like SB 1383, which is requiring us to, uh, to uh, look at our waste distribution, uh, what's happening with our waste streams, uh, all of those are, are going to be part of our uh, recycling and our, and our uh, waste uh, elimination program uh, moving forward, and we've been very successful with that. Uh, but there's more to do. And so as we think about our goals in our program, there's a lot more to do and, and we need to keep moving forward as we look about the goals for our facilities master plan. Really what we need to do is develop a plan towards the 100% clean energy. This is something that not only is uh, required for us, but it's society expectations. Uh, th this is just the, the reality of, of uh, the world as we move forward. Uh, in looking at how we're going to be sustainable and towards a clean energy future. Utility costs are a big incentive for us. As those continue to rise and as power becomes more and more costly as we move forward, the ability to uh, produce on-site generation, which helps us towards this goal, is, is super important to us. And we're being mandated to do this. The state has goals uh, to, to reduce and ultimately become 100% uh, renewable power with zero carbon by 2045. And so the state has been implementing uh, changes. There's a new significant change coming in January of 23 called our Cal Green Code uh, as we implement those moving forward so that work we do uh, in the future will require us to, uh, to be more sustainable. Uh, and really as we move forward in our goals is to, is to integrate this work into our facilities master plan. It's important that we think about the work not in, in, in and of itself, but as it relates to other work that we're doing, other priorities that we have in our district, other educational needs, equity needs, other, other focuses that we have in our district, and ensure that the work of sustainability is incorporated into those other competing priorities that we have across the district. Uh, it needs to be tied to uh, funding and a timeline, a, a realistic timeline. Uh, again, it all co that all uh, coincides with, the, with each other uh, in the form of our facilities master plan. These are kind of some of the, the basic goals that we have in our, in our sustainability component of the, of the plan. I wanted, before I call up the young folks to, to talk with you, I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of a progress bar. I think this is a great little example. Uh, this shows that, that at the time we, we took these measurements, our total consumption in our district was about 43 and a half megawatts of power and increasing. Every project that David Miranda and his team complete, uh, that number continues to go up. As we rely more and more on electrical needs in our schools, uh, that number will continue to rise and we expect it to continue to, to rise. Mr. Eisen, could yes. you just give us a sense of what 43 million, 500,000, are we talking like Dr. Brown, like 1.21 gigawatts? Yeah, yeah. Kind of uh, I, I, do, I don't know, that's a <laughs> lot, I'll say this, that's a lot of power, right? Uh, that is a lot of power. Uh, I, I don't have it in terms of the number of cars or the number of or locomotives costs. or those kind of things. Uh, cost is somewhere just over eight and a half million dollars a year in energy costs is what we what we spend every year, right? And we could we, could we, could we light a small city with that? Yes, <laughs> yeah, we are we are in essence a small city in and okay. of ourselves, okay. uh, and it's. It's uh, enough power to run a small city. Yes, it is. And, okay. and when you think about the demands of a school, especially a, a school that's being driven by technology needs and all of the things that we do in our school, it's quite a lot of power. And so we have a goal ahead of us to how do we address that? How do we, how do we curb that increased cost moving forward, that increased demand, uh, and become more sustainable as we go forward? And that's kind of the nature of, of what our challenge is yep. moving forward. Uh, Dr. Kell and I are just looking at each other, waiting for you to say 1.21 gigawatts. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. We're not there yet, but we, but we might get here. Gigawatts a lot. Uh, uh, 
So, uh, so of that, I just wanted to point out a couple of quick things. The two little, uh, the two areas, the dark blue and, and the kind of orangish color, that, that's the power that we currently are producing with our own solar systems, which is about 9.2 megawatts of power is what we're producing. We are currently working on a proposal, which we will be bringing to the, forward to the board in the near future, about the possibility of doing another 16 sites in our district that will come up somewhere about 6.3 additional megawatts of power. And so this is part of our ongoing effort to, re to look at solar and, and the viability of putting solar at our school sites. Uh, it's not a perfect solution because not all school sites are, are really uh, suitable for solar. Uh, there are efforts at the state level to uh, change some of the rate structures and limit the ability for us to uh, benefit from uh, the installation of solar. You may have heard of net energy metering three. Uh, those are things that we're working state le statewide to. Uh, we're not in support of that because that will limit our the value that we have of the current solar that, that we build. But but it just kind of puts it in, in perspective of where we're at and it's growing. So the problem is something we need to address uh, as soon as possible. So uh, with that, I am going to turn it over to our to our young folks who are in the audience that want to come up and talk with us today. So our our green schools campaign. So first of all, Diana Michelson from 11th grader from Poly. We also have uh, Rohan Reddy, uh, an 11th grader from Polly as well. And we have Emma Wynn, who's an 11th grader from uh, Milliken, that will be talking to them about the, the energy goals. Good morning, Diana, Rohan, and Emma. It's uh, good to have you here with us. We have heard you and seen you at our school board meetings, and we've had a chance to interact with you virtually as well. So thank you for being here this morning with us. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Uh, thank you all for having us here. We're really excited to present and also discuss. I know we haven't had that chance with previous board meetings, uh, but I'll let go ahead and let Rohan introduce our initiative and its goals. To begin, I would like to outline our goals for our campaign. And so we would like to see LBUSD transition to 100% clean renewable energy in the electricity sector by 2030 and in all other energy sectors, including transportation, HVAC, and cooking by 2040. And now I'll pass it on to Emma. So to get this started, I'm gonna talk about LBUSD energy consumption. Um, oh, sorry, you're good. On the slide, you can see that it, from the 2020, 2020 to 21 school year, LBUSD spent $8.5 million on electricity. Um, in LBUSD, the total greenhouse gas emissions for gas, electric, and diesel were calculated to come around 14,000 metric tons per year, which is equivalent to emissions from about 2,000 homes in Long Beach. Um, electricity accounts for about 67% of the greenhouse gas emissions that LBUSD produces. These calculations were, uh, we calculated them as a courtesy of Croton 100, which is a volunteer initiative set in Hudson, New York, um, who have worked with us to help us find these statistics for all of you guys. So I'm going to hand it off to Diana. Um, so you've definitely heard us a lot at the uh, past board meetings. So there's we've definitely discussed some of the reasons why it's important to us. I think, first of all, we're obviously living in a coastal city. We're seeing ocean levels rise right in front of our eyes. Uh, beyond that, we're students who have been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, spent a majority of our high school careers in online learning. And the um, dirty air definitely exacerbates the um, medical issues and costs associated with viruses such as the COVID-19, uh, such as COVID-19. And obviously this would only grow with the other viruses that we will likely see in the future. Furthermore, uh, transitioning to clean renewable energy has the potential for significant cost savings over time. And that money saved can be reinvested into our underserved students and classrooms and can help support school finances. In addition, uh, transitioning to clean energy can create opportunities for uh, climate curriculum and hands-on STEM education, and we could even have our high school students uh, work on these projects themselves in the future. So we also would just like to highlight that this is something that is 100% possible and already happening. We understand that committing to 100% clean energy would be a political statement for the school board, but it can and will place us as a leader, as, as well as a model for districts in and near us in California. At the end of the day, change is happening and LBOSD will soon be required by state mandates, such as Senate Bill 100, to start 
moving towards renewable-based energy in 2020, 2045, which was mentioned by Mr. Rising. So why not stand out as a leader? Additionally, while we develop better technology, we will have more efficient systems, which will create the ability for us to have this transition. And fossil fuels are, the use of fossil fuels, sorry, <laughs> the cost of fossil fuels is increasing while the cost <coughs> of renewable energy has been decreasing. So why not just increase our use of renewable energy? And just to be really brief on this section, I know Mr. Rising hit on this as well, but we are really, really happy to see the district already incorporating many uh, energy incentives. I know that we passed board, uh, board policy 3510, and then on top of that, we've seen the carports. In fact, carports are definitely something we really support because they're cheaper than, um, than rooftop solar. In addition, they um, can provide shade structures, which can help reduce heat islands and also reduce costs and energy consumption on cooling. As I had mentioned previously, the move to 100% clean energy is nationwide. Um, I mentioned Croton 100, which is an initiative in New York, but I'd also like to touch base on Miami-Dade and Salt Lake City, which are outside of California, as well as a few sites closer to home, such as LAUSD, which is the largest school district in California, whose goal is to reach net zero by 2040, and they are expected to save $25 million in 25 years. Another one that's a little bit closer, that's a little further from home, but still in California, is San Diego Unified School District, with six million dollars in savings per year, and is set to achieve net zero by 2035. The Poly Green Schools campaign was founded in the summer of 2020 and has since grown into a district-wide movement of students, parents, and teachers from elementary, middle, and high schools. We have also. Uh, gain the support of many community organizations such as the Long Beach Sunrise Movement, LA Climate Reality Chapter, and many others. We also have met with many uh, energy expert companies such as SoCal Edison, Perma City, and Grid Alternatives, and we have the support of key council members of Long Beach, including Rex, Rich Rex, uh, excuse me, Rex Richardson, Mary Zendejas, Susie Price, Al and Al Austin, and we have met with Long Beach uh, facilities managers as well. To move on our main focus, I'm going to start off by explaining some main points of our resolution. A copy has been handed to each of you physically as well as emailed to each of you. So the main goal of our resolution is to have the, the board direct the facilities service division to assemble and oversee the creation of a task force. This task force will formulate a plan, assess energy footprints of LBUSD, Re reduce consumption of um, different energy and explore the most effective and beneficial financial pathways to implement such a plan. In combination with our resolution, we would like to see commitments made through the facilities master plan. However, our goal is to have LBUSD make a political statement in support of clean energy that is supported by the separate facilities master plan. And it would be really naive of us today to assume that cost is not a big aspect of this. And more so, I would like to mention that one of our key aspects of our resolution, specifically on page three, is that we have added a qualifier. After working with Mr. Rising for about six months on editing this resolution, uh, hearing feedback from other school districts on what is working for them currently and what has changed throughout the resolution process as well, we have decided that a qualifier is probably the best way to approach the situation. Not to mention, uh, with all of these facility update programs uh, that we heard from Mr. Rising and uh, Mr. Miranda, you're probably thinking, well, you know, will Wilson need to be updated in 20 years? And the answer to that is probably not. The equipment, the um, the furniture, the electric, the electrical work, there is just going to be no need um, to update it in 20 years. It won't be environmentally or economically feasible. And so to that, we're hoping that the um, the over uh, the overarching uh, qualifier can help uh, qualify that to make sure to, to make us because at the end of the day we're trying to make a political statement we understand that net zero goal a uh, net zero emission is the end goal but if it's not environmentally feasible 
and non-environmentally sound, for example, to purchase a whole new set of equipment for Wilson when their equipment is going to last for an additional 20 years, for example. Um, one of our big asks is that we understand that this is a political statement and a commitment from the district to serve as a leader, and um, that small details like this will be important in the overarching goal, but will also have to be fall under potentially the qualifier. To add on for funding, as we've stated before, the implementation plan, no, you're sorry about that. The implementation plan um, will be created by the task force, and so with the passing of our resolution, um, that task force will look further into funding, but a few examples that we already know of would be federal and state grants, such as the federal bipartisan bill and the renewable energy production incentive. For the specific case of funding for electric school buses, there are a variety of options available, such as money from the Volkswagen settlement or the Air Resources Grant. So there are a variety of ways that we could acquire funding for electric school buses. I'd also like to just touch on the fact that uh, in San Diego Uni Unified School District, they used a capital bond program where they asked voters and were able to raise money to um, get renewable energy sources. Yeah, and just to add on to Emma, I know that LBUSD has already uh, used many capital bond programs, and I know that there's definitely a lot of potential to expand on this as well. Um, I also want to mention the ESCOs, which is an energy services company. So this would essentially be a tool that LBUSD uh, can utilize. So it would be a contract that the school would enter, uh, enter into with a third party. And um, this is what school districts such as Huntington Beach, San Diego, uh, and Manhattan have done to achieve net zero or uh, really uh, progressive energy efficiency programs. Um, uh, ESCO can also help arrange programs such as PPAs or p power purchase agreements. And essentially a power purchase agreement is where there's a little to no upfront cost for the district and it would reduce energy costs um, while solar uh, panels are being um, placed on the school district. Um, so once again, that those are just two ways that the district could, fin could financially um, uh, move forward with this transition and not to mention PPAs have been something that the district has already used especially on those 24 carports um, that we've just that were discussed earlier in this presentation there are also some utility supplied programs that we could use to aid in our goal of achieving 100% renewable energy for example there are rebate programs such as the uh, California Food Service instant uh, instant rebates program but also we could buy a 100% clean energy mix from uh, utility companies and this could help to achieve, um, well, could to help to uh, fill in the gaps when we aren't able to produce enough uh, power ourselves. However, this does come with an 8% cost increase, so it would have to be integrated, integrated with other systems in, in order to ensure economic feasibility for the district. I would also like to touch on energy efficiency programs. So in addition to having LED lights and smart thermostats, um, you could implement systems such as silicone masks on roofs to reflect light and reduce energy on heating pumps, um, as well as um, invest in stra um, strap-on technology, which is offered by Permacity for solar roofing, which eliminates the need to drill and saves us money. Another way to implement um, energy efficiency within classrooms and other district buildings would be to have motion sensors in order to uh, regulate the lighting and heating within classrooms and buildings, um, which would work with the smart thermostats. So I'd like to hand it off to Diana to close us out. So once again, we really do thank you for your time today. And to close this off, we really do want to ask um, and hopefully discuss this uh, after our presentation. You know, what is a reasonable timeline and when can we get a commitment for this? I know we've been, we have countless support. We have a petition with over a thousand signatures, countless community supporters and uh, organizations. I know, oops, sorry about that. I know we've uh, sent those papers uh, your way as well, um, but you know we are willing to work uh, on editing the resolution. We understand that there is the concern over the actual um, uh, length that a school district uh, can, you know, uh, before it needs to be updated. So 
Wilson is the prime example here as well. Um, but, you know, we are willing to work. We want to change the resolution so that it is specific to our district, and we've already been doing that for the past six months. And we want something that is passable, but also something that commits LBUSD as a leader, because at the end of the day, this has to be done. It's happening statewide. And why not, why not stand out as a leader? So that's all from us today. We really do look forward to discussions and are here to answer any questions. So thank you so much. Thank you. Great presentation to the three of you, and congratulations for doing this. Um, I'll open it up for this. Sorry. Mr. Risen, did you want to add something? Yeah, yeah I just, uh, if you want some questions, you can go ahead. I just have some, some follow-up to. Why don't we hear your follow-up, and, we'll, and then we'll open it up to questions and discussions. Can we sit here, or? Uh, can we? Yeah, you can probably. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Sit down. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. You, can, okay. you can sit down. Thank you. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll you're not going anywhere. We'll, yeah, we'll call yeah, you back. Yeah, then. we're not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So just just in closing, first of all, th you know, thank our, our our most important customers for coming in and talking to us about about their goals. So I do appreciate uh, coming in and talking to us. But just kind of capping the conversation and talking about moving forward and some of the challenges that we as a district will face as we think about the the kind of tiered approach. Uh, the challenge of the 2030 100% uh, renewable power approach, uh, first of all, a reminder, that's a, sh a short eight years away. Uh, and we will have some uh, challenges with some funding, the ability to really look closely at some of our existing systems that we have in our schools. Uh, Mr. M Miranda uh, reported about uh, uh, some of the school sites that are not currently in our program and the ability to address some of those systems that we have to help uh, eliminate our demand on power to uh, to be able to reduce or, or somehow curb the, uh, the the power that we do have to purchase uh, that we don't that we don't produce ourselves as well as the power the the power or the ability to uh, build our own solar right to build our own uh, generation capability within our district uh, which will not be a complete uh, solution to the entire problem so the ability to look at all of those different funding sources and strategies is going to be a big challenge in just a few short eight years to be able to get that done. A uh, timeline, the aggressive timeline of eight years. Uh, on average, it takes us about two years to take a project from conception into actual construction. Uh, so even if, even starting today, our first projects would not really not be on the streets uh, uh, for another two years. So that, that kind of gives us a little bit of queuing time uh, that we need to make a lot of decisions on how we're going to be able to comply with this. So I think that the timeline really becomes compressed as we think about how we would move forward into that. Uh, there are options to be able to just purchase power, purchase green power. Uh, but on average, you're going to see a 9 10% increase in our ongoing electrical costs uh, for the power that we do use. And that's why it's so important for us to look at curbing our, our usage, right? uh, reducing our demand. Uh, uh, the, the energy demands continue to go up. Uh, as Measure E projects are completed, we're kind of chasing uh, a little goal there in order to, to ensure that we have enough power that we're generating in, in, uh, internally, as well as buying the best power and to, to be able to move to that. Again, I think I'd mentioned it's between our, our costs ongoing to be 850, maybe to a million dollars a year uh, currently and going up as we think about implementing uh, green power if we were to purchase it. Uh, it could be obtainable, but, it, but there could be some cost and some impl implications behind the first tier of, of reaching by 2030. Uh, as we move forward into the 2040, uh, it becomes much more significant obstacles that, that are in our place. And again, just, just as a reminder, that's a short 18 years away. Uh, uh, really, again, we talk about funding, right? Major systems changes. The average age of our schools are about 63 years old. Those systems really do not uh, uh, we, we don't have some good viable solutions for how to take some of those existing systems that we have and convert those into electrified systems. So it'll take a complete redesign and rethinking about how we manage uh, things like heating and cooling in our schools. Uh, it can be done. Uh, some of the emerging technologies can be used as we think about applying those, but there's going to be some significant challenges in looking at this new designs and new technologies. Uh, and in fact, some of those technologies currently don't even exist. Uh, some of the solutions that are out there really don't 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 uh, don't meet our needs, such as backup generation power, 
right, in the, in the ability, in the eventuality that our grid were to go down and we would have power outages. Currently, we, we rely on diesel generators to, to help support us. So those kind of technologies that are sufficiently sized in order to power uh, our needs at school sites just currently don't exist. They possibly will in another 18 years, but we, we would have to kind of stay on, stay on top of that. Uh, we have a, another major uh, uh, issue with just our district fleet. When we talk about the 2040 goal, when we talk about in all energy sectors, it would also be our transportation fleet. We maintain somewhere around 350 vehicles to service our schools all around the district between mail services and delivery services, maintenance services, operations. Uh, all of those would need to be converted over to some sort of electric power. Uh, recently, uh, some of the major auto manufacturers have just come out with their first uh, pickup trucks, you know, first uh, that could even be used for that. But again, they are very light duty, so we would have to really work with work to stay on top of the emerging technologies as we hope to, to uh, use some of those electrified uh, vehicle m methods. And then there's an infrastructure component to that. We would have to have uh, the infrastructure to charge those stations, so multiple charging stations and, and uh, electrical infrastructure that would have to be built uh, district-wide in order to support those. Uh, when we talk about transportation, uh, we'd have to work closer with our vendors. We currently do not maintain a, uh, a continuous transportation fleet. I think we have about seven buses that we maintain that are all compressed natural gas. Uh, they're only being used for backup and emergency purposes, field trips, those type of things. Uh, so we'd have to work with our vendors as they convert to uh, electri electric school buses uh, to be able to, to transport our students. Uh, and then lastly, point out uh, a major infrastructure concern that a lot of folks are working on is uh, nutrition services. The thousands upon thousands of meals that we serve every day are all largely dependent on natural gas uh, for, for heat sources to, to, uh, to cook those meals and to provide those meals to our students. So that would be a significant uh, rethinking, redesign, and rebuilding of all of our nutrition services centers, uh, not only at school sites, but our manufacturing kitchen as well as we think about how we would, uh, we would convert to, uh, to a 100% uh, green renewable power uh, system. So again, I think I'd mentioned uh, some of these technologies currently don't even exist that we'd have to work with the industry to stay on top of that. Uh, and I pointed out, I think it, the state's goal is 100% uh, renewable energy by 2045. Just, you know, this, they've recognized that there's possibly some need for some additional time there as well in order to uh, to make this happen. So next steps, uh, really our recommendations is we work closely with our facility staff and our facilities master plan to develop a plan towards 100% clean energy. We realize that, that that's a requirement and society is, is and regulatory is requiring us to go there. So develop what that plan looks like so that it's actionable that it's actually incorporated into our facilities master plan so that it can address all of those competing priorities and the needs that we have uh, across our district. Uh, we, we have a challenge of, of what to do with some of the existing systems that we have. We've been in Measure E now since 2016, so most of our school sites were based on old uh, design standards that did not incorporate the desire to go to 100% green power at that time. So we would need to think about uh, using those systems until end of life where they would naturally need to be replaced. Uh, and then we would go back with some future uh, program to, to replace some of those systems that, that are you know, currently as we speak, almost brand new and the ability to, to, to use those through the end of their life. Uh, we, we're also recommending that we continue to develop solar programs and continue to put solar in our school sites. I think I'd mentioned you we're looking at another 16 sites, uh, just a little bit over six megawatts of power in our next phase and continue to look at that and continue to lobby with our state legislators to ensure that the incentives are available to us to make it cost effective for us to be able to put additional solar in. Uh, and so that was, those were our recommendations. And so we're available for questions. And I know our young folks are available for questions uh, if we have any. Thank you, Alan. And I apologize. I, I, I missed the last few slides. So I didn't you know, remember to call you back No problem. Up. No problem. So colleagues, questions, discussion? Yeah. So uh, I first wanted to applaud our presenters today. Uh, uh, I was very much uh, impressed with you all uh, on two fronts. One, uh, just your articulation um, and your willingness to get in front of all of these fancy adults and to present a very tough topic. 
uh, I can remember the anxieties of uh, public presentations as a youth, so I recognize how courageous it, it uh, how much courage it takes to get up there, but also uh, how prepared you all were. Uh, second, I also was impressed with the, your knowledge, and clearly you guys have done the your homework and your investigation, investigative knowledge to be prepared to discuss this with us today, because a lot of the questions that I was going to have, you guys have already answered them. Uh, I did have some larger questions for our team at the district, so Alan and David. I just wanted to get some confirmation here. So we talked about a couple of projects that are upcoming here. In regards to our upcoming projects, have we work towards making sure that those projects are LEED certified? Uh, so LEED certification is a different level of, of certification that gets more in beyond even energy sustainability. Correct. Uh, it talks about like recycling components mm -hmm. and a lot of other things. Uh, so LEED certification, we what's called self-certify. We don't apply to get LEED certification, but we do comply with the general concepts of, of the LEED program. So, But uh, we internally aren't trying to go for like lead certification silver or gold or any of those things yeah no we we don't we don't internally have a a policy to go after a particular level of lead we apply the the the, the design standards of lead but we don't actually go after any of the certifications hmm. okay I, I didn't know that that i, I think that that's something that we should consider especially with some of our newer projects um but that answers one of my questions. The uh, second one, which is not necessarily related to LEED certification, but it was talking about one of the suggestions from our youth here, which I 100% support, in regards to putting together a task force uh, to essentially look at the problem. I think you already presented it to us in regards to how much energy we spend in a year and kind of working our way backwards. Uh, <laughs> the one thing that concerns me, this is, a, this is an Ericism here. Um, when I was in the field of construction and architecture, I used to tell clients that when it comes to a project, you want it to be done fast, you want it to be done cheaply, and you want it to be done with high quality. Pick one, because you're not going to get the other two. <laughs> so, so unfortunately, we know that that's going to be the same situation when it comes to uh, addressing our energy concerns as well. And so, uh, but I do think that that is a conversation that would be best presented for the task force to speak to, hey, we know what the problem is. We also know that one of these three f factors are going to be our decision, and we unfortunately are going to ask the district to support the other two. So I just would want to share those two suggestions uh, and also the consideration of just uh, lead certification of silver or gold on upcoming projects because I think that would be an influential component to supporting our um, uh, sustainability efforts moving forward. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we, we're definitely supportive in that transparency and working with our community. Uh, the task force is a fantastic idea as we pull together to really get some ideas from some, you know, very smart folks like, like our young folks here that, to uh, really help drive what our community is looking for. Absolutely. Um, just on the note of the task force, uh, some of the things that you presented to us, Alan, uh, sounds like you're doing some of that work already. Um, it's not named a task force, but on the, even on the timeline, you have the different uh, committees that you've been working consistently with. Yeah, I think uh, the difference is that, that as we work with the sustainability committee, we're identifying the goals of the program, so what the priorities of the program and the areas that we would want to focus in. I think the task force would be more f focused on the implementation component of it. Uh, is is you know maybe which direction we're going to to what level we're going to whether we go for things like lead silver lead gold so the implementation of the task force would be after the facilities plan in order to help us to implement it Were you going to add something else, Ms. Kerr? No, that was my fault. Oh, okay. Sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> that was just while we were talking about task force, <laughs> okay. and I was referencing the notes I written. Um, other colleagues? Um, yes. So you mentioned things like um, all of our kitchens at, at our schools would have to um, transfer over to electric appliances. Do we have a cost connected to that um, I'll part say of the current, plan? 
currently we do not. That is something that we're analyzing to be a part of the master plan. Uh, it, you know, as we identify the long-term goals of, of what, what we're going to, and as I said, developing that plan towards 100% clean power, uh, that is going to be a significant component of, of what we would have to look at. The vast majority of our, of our cooking appliances are all natural gas uh, powered. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's been a cheap uh, energy source that's that been used for many, many, many decades. And so realizing that the goal of not only the state but of, but of society is to move towards clean power, we would need to plug in what that would look like in a time frame for us to be able to, to, to do that. So would that be something that um, we're going to be looking at regardless of whether we adopt a resolution or not? That's something we're looking at. So it would be part of a resolution uh, potentially. Yeah, there's so not only do we are, are we looking at it as far as just our overall sustainability <coughs> goals, but also, as I mentioned, uh, as far as regulations, the state uh, back in, I believe, 2018 adopted goals towards 100% uh, energy, uh, uh, renewable energy, uh, with a goal at the state level of 2045. So it really comes down to, uh, you know, we, how much would we do of our own accord versus how much are we going to be required to do and what does that timeline look like? Because there is a point where we'll be mandated uh, to be using 100% clean power uh, at the state level. Right, and that's by 2045? 20, 2045, at the, the, the state's goal has been established, yes. And when we're taking a look at the, um, the kitchens, does that include our nutrition services facility? Yes, it would be our manufacturing kitchen as well, as well as all of the appliances that are at our individual school sites, the, the reheat appliances, mm -hmm. which some of the reheats are, you know, they're electric already. Uh, but a lot of the, the ovens and other type of things that are at school sites are all natural gas powered. So we would need to think about those as well as our large manufacturing kitchen. And with respect to our fleet, we currently have approximately seven buses but the other vehicles uh, approximately 350 so we would have to we would have to replace that fleet over the next uh so many years i understand i, I don't know if we have a, a number um associated with that cost but when we contract for the other buses for our you know special ed um, transportation that sort of thing how how would that um, impact our use of uh, you know or reliance on fossil fuels fossil fuels yeah so there's a couple of points there one is our our bus fleet does not uh, run regularly it, it right. primarily uh, is in our yard as a surplus or a backup fleet that's used for mm -hmm. Uh, field trips, uh, midday field trips uh, on occasion. It's also been used a lot recently because of the lack of bus drivers. And so our district staff, we've repurposed some of our existing drivers, our, our delivery drivers who have bus certifications uh, to be able to ensure that our students get, get to school each day. So our bus fleet though uh, is natural gas and it, and it, prim it doesn't run regularly like, a, like our vendor fleet does. We primarily rely on our vendor fleet. Uh, the challenge there would be working with our vendors to to convert to electric school buses uh, and uh, what that time frame may look like because clearly they're a business and so they have an in, they have an investment they would need to make in order to convert to that to to, to electric school buses to be able to do that uh, they may or may not have the same incentive programs available to them as we would uh, as a governmental agency versus a private entity. So uh, those are some things that would have to be discussed and, and details that have to be worked out. In addition to that, we have about 350, what we call our white fleet, our small vehicle fleet, you know, our, our mail delivery drivers, our nutrition services drivers, our trucks, our maintenance fleet, those, those folks. Uh, yes, all of those vehicles would ultimately need to be converted with this, with this potential resolution uh, towards electric power. It's important to note that the state's goal of 2045 is not, quote, all energy sectors. It's 100% it's uh, renewable electricity. Uh, when we talk about in all energy sectors is when you begin to bring in things like transportation discussions, 
and this would be an area where we would potentially go above above what the state is is currently planning for right and do we have plans to um, audit that situation with the fleet and what the cost is to replace that so this would be a situation where currently the the the, the infrastructure really doesn't exist when we talk about uh, like our like our maintenance service vehicles, which is a large piece of our white fleet. Uh, those are all heavy duty three quarter ton to one ton pickup trucks that, that are all converted with utility beds. Uh, the major automobile manufacturers have only recently come out with electric uh, pickups, electric uh, service trucks. Uh, they're, they're all light duty uh, half ton trucks. You may have seen them advertisements on uh, on, on the television. Uh, so there's still a technology leap there we have to get to to have vehicles that are capable of hauling the type of weight and the type of, uh, of things that we do with our maintenance fleets. Uh, some of the larger trucks are available. They're, they're still in infancy. Some of the technology would still need to be developed uh, in order to become reliable. Things like the distance they can travel, those type of things would still need to be developed. Uh, so those are areas where we would still need to monitor and, and plan for when we would potentially change uh, all of our vehicles over to electrification and then I'll point out again is the infrastructure right the ability to where would we charge these vehicles what what's that infrastructure that would need to be put into place so that all these vehicles are ready to go in the morning when when we need them right okay thank you um, I also want to thank the students I think you guys have done a really great job and um, it it's, it speaks a lot to your commitment and compassion for the cause, which, you know, is going to benefit all of us. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Trackhead. Ms. Kerr, I know you left off with a couple of thoughts pending. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for coming, Diana, Rohan, and Emma. Um, and I see Mr. Gologli tucked in the corner as well. Um, I think this is what we would call experiential and work-based learning that they are getting today. Uh, so thank you uh, for being here instead of in your classroom. Um, and thank you for the work that you've done. I know that when, we, when I've talked to staff um, following up, they talk about the learning that they have done from you in your advocacy over this time. Um, and when we first started meeting you know, well over a year ago, really talking about the goals and the work uh, that you want the district to do um, in terms of putting practices into place that do the things that stop um, the destruction of the planet. I've, I've heard that clearly from you. I've heard that clearly from the students who have joined you uh, when you come to speak to us at board meetings. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that I hear all of that. Um, and I hear the urgency for your generation in us to work faster. Uh, so thank you for continuing to prod us um, to do that. Um, and we also, when we first started talking, talked about how do we implement um, actual work that is reflective of um, the things in the policy. And I know that I've talked to you about that this board takes really seriously when we pass resolutions, and I think it was even stated in the presentation that we want to do actionable things, things that we can commit to. So when we pass inclusion policies and equity policies, those are things we hold ourselves accountable, and we have timelines in order to do that work, um, which is why I think we've talked about and we've integrated um, your voices and and bringing you into the team to do the planning around the facilities master plan so we could do that actionable concrete thing um, that has the result that we're looking for um, so I want to thank you for continuing to engage with us and we look forward to um, on that timeline uh, that continued investment not just of you and your peers but also the greater community in doing that work. I will say that it's interesting because today I heard a different ask from you. So we've talked about doing the things um, that get us to those goals, that get us to um, the actual work, whether it's facilities or cars or solar. Um, today what I heard from you is you want a political commitment. You want a political statement. And I think it's the first time I've heard you say that in all of the time um, that we've been meeting. And so. I was operating from a place of how do we get in and do the work? How do we set policy that allows for the work to happen? Um, so it just, it was different today to hear you ask for the political ask of an aspirational statement. Um, because what I heard in our presentation from staff was um, obviously your influence in the planning process and projects, literal changes to projects based on the input that you've given. 
Um, so I just think that's an interesting place for us to be that, that, that I hear the ask differently today. Um, so I'm interested in having that conversation of, you talked about um, working on changing language around the resolution, not potentially just as cost allows as a qualifier, but substantive changes that incorporate the work, like the language from the facilities master plan. So I just wanted to reflect that I heard that differently today. I don't know if that was your intention that it was different, but I just wanted to reflect that I heard it differently today. Let, let me affirm that, because I heard the same thing, uh, Board Member Kerr, and then I'll, I'll bounce it back to Mr. Miller. So um, um, make sure that we heard you correctly, and feel free to come up to the mic. So um, we did hear from you today, the political ask is for us to make a political statement as a leader uh, in this area. Um, and I think what you heard here from our facilities team and, and what I've heard from our colleagues here is uh, that our district, and I'll speak I here first. Let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me do that, let me be careful. I agree with and fully support the commitment to be 100% um, clean and renewable, right? And, and, and I think I'm hearing this, is this, yes, I'm getting nods from our facilities team. Uh, and that is a big aspirational component of this draft resolution. What I want to kind of uh, clarify here is, um, and, and I think I heard it, um, that you understand and you um, hear and see that there are challenges with reaching certain things by certain timelines. So m my question in reference to Board Member Kerr is, is there an openness given that you know that there are some structural uh, and cost-related issues to uh, work on the wording of it. Keep the aspirational, right? We all want to get to 100% uh, clean and renewable energy uh, and, and maybe get ahead of that 40, 20 to 45 uh, time lapse that the state's requiring and, and, and advancing it beyond just the electric, uh, right, that you shared. Uh, is there an openness to edit, you know, some of the, so the concrete aspects of the resolution, and I'm not, it's not up for, for, for a discussion today, but I, I want to sort of affirm that I'm hearing correctly that you understand, and you use the term qualifier, right? That's what, that's what to me, kind of sparked that. You know that not all of this can be achievable given the specific things that we have here. Um, and then the second part of that is understanding that there is alignment already with our facilities master plan, but there are additional things that we would have to do uh, to get on that pathway to 100% new, um, I'm sorry, clean and renewable. So just want, want to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, so absolutely. Um, to answer your first question specifically regarding actually impl implementing this and uh, changing the language, that is definitely something we're looking at. Specifically, maybe adding a specific section on um, having this be a transition as new school sites are added. I mean, not school sites, as a new school sites are updated. Not new, sorry, I apologize. Not new school sites, but as school sites are updated. Um, so that would mean that upcoming projects, um, I know that we're about like every time we update a project, it's like a year, and there's planning that's like goes like one to two years in advance. So we're not even talking about those projects, but we're talking about the projects that are coming up in four to five years, making sure that they abide by 100% clean renewable energy commitment. Um, and then, of course, um, uh, Ms. Kerr and Dr. Benitez, um, you are totally right. We have kind of changed the sentiment uh, slightly because what we've realized through countless discussions, especially with San Diego, I think it's really um, interesting to reference them because we've met with them um, and they are set to achieve 100% clean energy by 2035, but they started about 10 years before us. And I think that that is really important to note because you know, at our current, we do produce about 20% of our electricity via solar panels, but we're probably, but you know, there is a lot of potential, and not to mention the technology that is constantly improving, the rates that are constantly going up from SoCal Edison, from other utility rates, those are constantly going up, and renewable energy not only is the technology improving, but it is becoming cheaper. So um, it is a little bit of a leap of faith, and we do recognize that, and that's why we do really want to highlight that um, our resolution does want to adjust to the needs, not only mentioning that, you know, uh, adding school, I mean, updating school districts, making sure that all new school districts from this point on, not sorry, not school districts, all new school facilities from this point um, follow a 100% clean energy um, guideline. 
Um, and then to follow up with the facilities master plan, um, we have been working on that committee for about six months, about, yeah. And we have been really excited. You know, we've had students from all corners of the district attend on behalf of the Long Beach Green Schools campaign. And um, definitely one of the, uh, one of our asks, although we completely agree, like we are completely in support of everything from food waste, recycling, um, what we definitely want to highlight and the reason we want a specific resolution is because um, we want something that is specifically targeted towards clean energy. So obviously the facilities master plan uh, follows furniture and all of that is, and, and furniture and tons of other stuff as discussed earlier. And that is something that we are in complete support of, but we do want something, a document that is specifically passed that is a, that is a political statement that, you know, does, you know, I, I think that what we're realizing is are we probably going like 100% clean renewable by 2040? Probably won't be likely. But if we keep that resolution open, I mean, if we keep the language open to those goals, then we'll be open to, you know, the different funding that's coming in because there is a ton of funding. I know um, we've discussed some of the uh, busing, which isn't necessarily applicable for our district um, since we only have a very, since we have a very small fleet, but specifically from the federal level, level from the, uh, bipartisan bill uh, that Biden is passing, you know, there is a lot of potential there. Um, so kind of just um, the optimism there and hoping that, you know, not hoping, working sure that, making sure that all upcoming updates do follow a uh, clean energy guideline, uh, but understanding that schools like, I know I keep going back to Wilson, but schools like Wilson, not only is it not economically feasible, but probably won't, won't be environmentally feasible to have to replace all of that equipment in the next 20 years. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, and, and again, so the affirmation here is around the aspiration, uh, right, that we're all in agreement with that. So, Mr. Miller, I know you wanted to add a few things. Yeah, mine was actually going to piggyback on that statement there. I think that it would be beneficial from our GSC team uh, to continue to think outside of the box. I would love to either participate or get an update on what I would consider a case study titled If Money Was No Object. I think that we often sit here and talk about the barriers of doing uh, activities, and we often talk about uh, finances being a barrier, and we often talk about relationships being a barrier from a physical standpoint and from a personal standpoint. But I think that if you all, the GSC team, all sat down and talked about if money was no object, how could we achieve this goal and started to work backwards? I think that it would be both an educational opportunity for you all, but for us as well to continue to think outside of the box. And this is, as we just talked about, knowing that technology is going to continue to evolve. There's even components of technology that haven't been designed yet that we know we will need to meet that 2040 goal. But to have that case study or that exercise performed, it's, it's almost like a college thesis, almost. <laughs> but I think that it would be both uh, an educational opportunity for both you and the district. So if, there, if I could throw out a suggestion out there, uh, to our GSC partners. That, that's something that I would love to see and maybe be a part of. Awesome. Mr. Otto, I think you've been waiting patiently. Um, and we also want to be cognizant of time here, folks. Well, not patiently, but... Uh, Impatiently, then. <laughs> Th thumbs twiddling. <laughs> Patience. Um, I, I come at this from a slightly different angle, and that is this. Um, last August, this board took the position that what we wouldn't really wanted to do, what we wanted to spend our time on, was at least 50% of our meetings devoted to student learning outcomes, that that was really what our job was. And so we're trying to pare back on the things that we do that don't directly relate to student learning outcomes at board meetings. I support uh, what you're doing 100%, but I wish that it would happen more offline than at the meetings because I don't think it's been very effective. I think that the fact that you're working with our facilities team is great. Uh, I think that more should be done. I think we should be brought in to, to, to help out with that. Um, there's, a lot, uh, to, there, there's a lot that can be done uh, offline. And um, I, I also agree with Ms. Kerr that, um, that what, we don't like to pass resolutions that we may not even, uh, we, we may not even outlive. Uh, because, you know, it seems like a gesture in the void. Uh, I get that other people are doing this. I get that it's a good idea. 
Uh, I'd like to see the mark of the Long Beach Unified School District being we say we're going to do things and we get those things done and we don't do things that uh, we don't make commitments to do things that are 25 years away. Uh, it doesn't mean that we can't have that conversation and we can't uh, in some way affirm, as I think I am, what it is that you want, but I want to make sure that we're focused on what it is that we do. Um, I sometimes winced when I was on the Long Beach City College Board when they talked about student insecurity, housing insecurity, and uh, food insecurity, thinking uh, we're not a social service agency. What we do is education, and I get that that's a component to it, but where, does you, where do you draw the line? I think the environment and how we relate to the environment is very, very important, but that uh, we need to stay focused on what it is that we do. So. Anything else? Thank you again. Um, so I just wanted to double check with um, staff. You, you put in a slide here on the facilities master plan sustainability. Will there be a section around, I don't know how you're constructing the actual document of the master plan. Um, is sustainability going to be a, a chapter in that report? Is it gonna be infused in all of the work? Um, just because we are literally out of time. <laughs> um, just the next steps in terms of how we continue the conversation, because we know we could talk, and talk and talk and talk. Um, but what we can expect in terms of, uh, I know there's community engagement sessions coming forward, so what we can expect to, how the conversation will continue in the next two months. So we'll continue to, with engagement, we'll identify priorities, I think there's gonna be several, but we do envision two components of sustainability built into the master plan. One where it's its own section on its own, right? So it's a standalone section, a component of the plan, it's clearly identifiable as such. But two, we do also envision um, within the project priorities, sustainability components built into each one of those priorities, right? So if it's a modernization effort or an HVAC effort at a given school site, 10 years out, we envision these sustainability components being built into that respective project as well. So really twofold. Thank you. Uh, so just to close this out uh, here, so to the students, we had a presentation on civic, our seal of civic engagement. You're doing it. Uh, here, so I, I do see our facilities directly connected to our student learning outcomes. Uh, our facilities team here is always reminding us how they're mindful that these are educational spaces directly tied to student learning, student learning outcomes. So keep doing what you're doing, uh, right? And 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 I and I do now get a better sense of the political statement, uh, right? That you're asking for uh, here, uh, and I think that's something that we need to ponder. Uh, on our board, uh, right? What, what can we do to be mindful of the challenges, um, uh, you know, to get to 100%, uh, but at the same time recognizing the importance, uh, especially for your generation of students, uh, that it is for institutions to uphold the values uh, that we talk about uh, here. So I, I understand the implications of a political statement as well. That's something that we will, you know, think about uh, and then potentially figure out you know, where do we achieve a balance, uh, right? And knowing that you are open to editing the resolution, I think there's opportunity uh, here for us. So thank you uh, again. And, uh, you know, I thought this was great today. So thank you to our team again. Uh, we're on a super tight schedule now. Dr. Baker, anything you want to say before we go to lunch break? Okay, we'll transition to lunch break. Uh, and then we'll, you know, see you later on today for our board meeting.